Gareth's, uh, will be Gareth's first meeting uh, as he's just recently taken up uh, the post vacated uh, recently by uh, Craig Greenstock, who retired. Uh, welcome also to Mike Whiteley and Nathan Couch from Audit Wales, who are attending the committee for the first time. And uh, Melian George will be attending to uh, answer any questions relating to the systems development audit. But it would be remiss of me not to put on record at the outset uh, the sad death of Conrad Kowinski, DHCW's Head of Quality and Regulation, uh, who appeared regularly at this committee since uh, DHCW was set up a year ago. And I'm sure you'd wish to join me in extending our heartfelt condolences to his family and friends at this very difficult time. He will be very, very much missed here. And our Executive Director of Finance, uh, Claire Osmond's little will uh, present the quality and regulation item in his place today. Uh, I shall begin, though, by asking my independent member colleagues to uh, introduce themselves, uh, beginning with the Vice Chair of the HCW, Ruth. Good morning, Borada, uh, Ruth Glazard, uh, independent member and Vice Chair of the HCW Board. Diolch Ruth. Uh, David Selway? David? Are you able to hear us? I think he's frozen. So um, I'll press on then. And in the interest of time, I shall introduce colleagues who are presenting, or perhaps you might like to do so yourself uh, when you're presenting or uh, asking a question or making an observation. Uh, we are holding this meeting virtually via Teams. And please note that the committee meeting is being recorded. Uh, this will be posted on DHCW's website at the end of this meeting. Uh, today's committee papers are publicly available, of course, uh, on DHCW's website. We are committed to openness and transparency and conduct as much as possible of our business in open session so that members of the public are welcome to uh, observe and attend. We have a full agenda, as you will have seen from the papers, uh, and I will be assuming that those in attendance have had the chance to read the papers before the meeting. Uh, there will be a short break of about 15 minutes built into today's meeting, planned uh, between sections three and four. For the record, I have been meeting with uh, colleagues from internal and external audit before today's meeting, that was on the 11th of April, uh, and I'd like to extend my thanks to them for taking the time to go through the issues in advance of today's meeting. So let's start with apologies for absence. Uh, I have uh, apologies from independent member Grace Quantock. Uh, Ivan Evans, the new Executive Director of Strategy, has tendered his apologies, and Michelle Sell and Julie Francis will deputise for him. Uh, apologies from Dave Thomas and Derwin Owen from Wales Audit, and from the Corporate Governance and Assurance Manager, Sophie Fuller. But I'll start with declarations of interest, uh, and I'd like to declare an interest with regard to Agenda Item 4.3, the Welsh Language Compliance Report. Um, as I chair the More Than Just Words Task and Finish Group uh, on the Strategic Welsh Language Framework, developing an action plan, um, as that's referenced in the report, uh, we will shortly be reporting to uh, the Minister for Health and Social Services. Uh, I've not been notified of any other declarations, but uh, just checking, are there any on uh, any item of interest on today's agenda? If not, then um, we'll press ahead to part two of uh, this morning's business uh, and uh, approval of the minutes from our public session held on January the 18th. Now you've had an opportunity to review these minutes. Uh, can I ask colleagues if you're happy to confirm uh, and approve the draft minutes? And uh, I can see uh, nods around the table. So uh, we are 
therefore approving the minutes from the public meeting of audit and assurance and these minutes will now be made available publicly uh, to agenda item 2.2 and that's approval of minutes from our private committee session on January the 18th. And in line with our standing orders, all decisions and key points discussed in private session uh, should be reported to the next public session of this committee. So uh, we therefore include as item 2.2, the English and Welsh summarised private minutes, uh, including decisions made in private session. So can I please ask you to review and confirm that you are happy to approve these minutes as an accurate record? Thank you, I can see uh, approval there. So if there aren't any observations or questions, let's move on to the action Sorry, log. Sure. I, I just wanted to make um, one observation, which I always make when we discuss the private minutes, which is whenever we have a private session, we challenge whether it should be held in private or not, just to make sure that actually we're conducting as much of our business in public as we possibly can. Um, so that would have been no different with this session, um, but minutes are approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and uh, just to confirm that uh, all our committee business uh, this morning is being held uh, in, in public. And thank you, Ruth, for making that point. So to the action log then, um, as you see, there were four actions captured from uh, January 18th. Uh, all four, as you see, have been completed and um, action documented in the action log. Uh, two of the outstanding actions are underway, updates included in the action log. Uh, action AO3 is complete and the paper will be included on the agenda for July's meeting. Any questions arising from the action log, colleagues? No. Um, I'll therefore take that uh, we are happy and we note the status of uh, the action log. Let's move forward then to agenda item 2.4, which is the forward work plan. Um, and um, this is included and I will ask our board secretary, Chris Darling, if there is anything of particular note you'd like to mention, Chris. Thanks, Chair. I think the areas just to point out from the forward work plan relate to July's meeting. So following discussion with yourself and Claire, there's a couple of uh, quality and regulatory items that we've moved to the July committee meeting. So the Cyber Res Resilience Unit update and the quality and regulatory annual review. They've been moved from today's meeting to the July uh, meeting. Um, we've also moved the WCCIS um, update from Audit Wales, which I'm sure they'll update on later, and hopefully that can come to the July session as well. Thank you, Chris. If there aren't any other questions on the, the forward work plan, um, that's been noted. And we'll then move on to part three of today's committee business and to uh, the audit and counter fraud section. Um, so uh, we will start with the internal audit progress report um, and I will shortly hand over to uh, uh, DHCW's internal audit uh, team for uh, uh, um, the presentation of that progress report which contains a general update uh, as well as the uh, anticipated meeting dates that uh, we can expect to receive uh, future internal audit reports. Um, it highlights progress against uh, the plan for 2021-22 uh, and presents an overview of uh, activity undertaken since our last committee meeting. Now, we are being asked as a committee to provide assurance to the board that DHCW has an appropriate internal audit plan in place and that is being delivered. Um, I shall also um, preempt by uh, uh, saying that we will then go directly on to the internal audit review reports, of which there are four. We are being asked to uh, note and receive these internal audit reports for assurance. Uh, and I'd like to invite Simon Cookson and Stephen Cheney to present um, the progress report and the four audit reports on uh, 
Data Center Project MOVE, Governance Part 2, System Development and Core Financials. Uh, and I suggest that we pause between each report to take any questions or observations. So then over to you, Simon. Thank you. Dichamal. Uh, Diolch Marian uh, Borada, everyone. Uh, good morning from us. Uh, Marian, you've um, you've you've literally gone through my introduction there, so thank you very much, and I won't uh, I won't go over it again. Um, as as ever, I'm joined by Stephen Cheney and Martin Lewis, uh, and we'll um, pick up the four individual reports shortly after we've been through the progress report, and then move on to the plan and uh, uh, a short paper I said I would bring along around KPIs and some of the work we're looking to do going forward there. Uh, Marianne, you're absolutely right. The progress report is, is here for noting this morning. It um, confirms that there are four reports completed since the last meeting, and we have two just to finish off for this year. Uh, one around workforce, which is in draft uh, and has a positive conclusion, and the directorate review uh, that we are just about to conclude on, uh, and both of those will come to the next meeting. Uh, along with that, we have now drafted uh, the head of internal audit opinion for the year, which is one of the key pieces of assurance, <clears throat> excuse me, you have and used to provide assurance uh, to the board from this committee. Uh, I'm pleased to say that will be a positive uh, outcome uh, overall in terms of very, a very strong, reasonable assurance overall. I think you'd be surprised if it was anything else, given the results of the reviews you've had during the course of the year, which have been uh, in the main reasonable, but a number of substantial uh, reviews as well and this morning you have one substantial and three reasonable assurance reviews uh, for the committee to uh, receive. Um, so I don't think there's anything else Marian I, I want to say in terms of the uh, the progress report uh, as ever cooperation has been uh, really positive uh, from the organisation uh, and of course one of the key things that we've worked on over the last couple of months is putting the plan together uh, for 22-23 which we'll come on to uh, a little bit later. So I'm happy to pause there, Marion, and uh, if there are any questions or comments uh, from members around the progress report. Thank you, Simon. So um, you have the progress report before you. Are there any questions or observations? <clears throat> Not at this stage. So uh, I can't see any hands up. I, I was only going to mention, yeah. I think when we started the year, uh, there was a comment that uh, these were very much back end loaded, if you remember, and uh, we were questioning our ability to deliver. I think what what this report shows is actually in the majority of cases we have actually been able to deliver and fulfil that requirement, which I think uh, shows a strength in terms of our working relationships with internal audit from a DHEW perspective. Thank you, Claire, for that. Um, Absolutely, and I think we'd all echo that. I don't think there are any other comments or observations, so uh, I'll hand back to you, Simon, then. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marianne. And uh, if, if, if I may just uh, very quickly pick up on that point, um, while we've been putting the plan together, we've had a number of discussions uh, you know, which, uh, which Chris has facilitated around you know, making sure we have a much smoother programme of work during the course of next year so that we have uh, more reports to the earlier audit committees in the year and less uh, toward the end. So uh, fingers crossed that's uh, that's where we'll all get to uh, next year. Uh, so thank you, Chair. We'll now move on to 3.2 and the four individual reviews. The reviews on data centre and systems development I'll ask Martin to introduce briefly and those around the second part of the governance and the core financials. I'll ask Stephen to introduce uh, and Chair, as you ask, we'll pause uh, after each uh, introduction for any questions or comments. So if I could hand over to Martin for the data centre review, which was substantial assurance. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, as um, Simon said, this was um, an audit looking at the um, governance process in place for the data centre move. Um, the key objectives were to review the project governance processes in place, uh, review the testing processes, and to look at the, um, the lessons learned and benefits from the project, and then to look at the current data centre provision. As Simon said, it um, comes out as substantial assurance. 
And um, what we found is they are very good, or there were very good controls in place um, for this. Um, there was a really good project structure. The project was subject to very good governance with a monitoring and frame, uh, monitoring, monitoring and reporting framework in place. And the project board worked well, as did the project teams and work streams underneath that. Um, <clears throat> the project um, completed all its objectives and provided the benefits as anticipated, um, which has led to a, a nice new data centre with an upgraded network. Um, there was a post-implementation uh, review done and lessons were identified from the project and they've been summarised into a report and shared across the organisation to feed into future projects. Um, so now you have um, two data centres in place, one's um, brand new and the other one is coming to the end of its contract. So work has um, started on looking at how that data centre can be upgraded and feeding in the lessons learned from the previous project. Um, the risk associated with the inconsistency between the two remaining data centres has been raised as a uh, risk on the registers being monitored. Um, there was no findings from the report as it was substantial assurance and everything we looked at as anticipated was in place. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, it's uh, pleasing to note that overall substantial assurance rating. Um, we have uh, with us this morning, Carolyn Lloyd-Jones, who's Director of ICT at uh, DHCW and is here to uh, respond to any questions or queries. Uh, Chrysler Carwin, Boreda. Uh, I assume that Carwin is here, so um, I will now turn to Ruth Glazard, who uh, has a question. Ruth. Deal, uh, Marion. Um, yeah, I think Carwin is Carwin is here with us. I just wanted to say, good job. I mean, this is a, this is a this is a great report and a great outcome for us. Um, it, but I'm not going to let him get away with just. Good job, well done, Caro, and excellent work. I, it would be interesting to know what learnings we can take from this forward into other projects, because we clearly have good controls around this piece of work. How are we gonna? How do we carry that forward to the next pieces of work? What application is there for for other projects? Um, yes. So the the main thing I think the the thing that we probably got most praise about was the communications. Uh, with the outside world in particular, you know, so letting people know when things were happening, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's probably the main bit uh, that we that we of learning that we can take forward. You know, um, as as you know, we we have a, another project coming up to move uh, our other data centre. Um, you know, in the next uh, in the next few months, uh, maybe up to about a year from now. Um, so we will take all of the learning into that. Um, I think there's been some things that we've learned afterwards as well that we will that we will kind of um, feed in as well into into that work. Yeah, Cameron, and you yeah. have identified uh, in um, uh, 2.22 of the the report that um, there is a, um, a, a post implementation review and and a process crucially to identify the lessons that have been learned and how they can be factored into future projects, which is uh, uh, really pleasing to, to hear. Uh, Claire Osmondson, Little. Thanks, Chair. I think uh, building on Carolyn's point, really, I think one of the things being part of that board that enabled us to work uh, effectively was the makeup of the board. The, the board was made up of representatives from across Wales, so we had um, uh, representatives from Huel there on the board, but equally some of our key uh, influencers to help us deliver that. And that combined with the transparency and open assessment of risk and the communications, I think that combined together enabled us to address this as a collective um, and, and deliver it on time. So, um, and, and equally, um, you know, working internally as a collective, both from a procurement, finance and operational perspective, also enabled us to be agile and respond and react in, in a collective way. So I think think that secret ingredient of communication, makeup of the board uh, and working um, transparently with a, with a good programme manager and programme process enabled us to deliver a, a pretty seamless um, transition to what was a, um, a big move for us as an organisation. 
Yeah, Claire, that's a really important milestone and you've highlighted some significant components within uh, the successful delivery of this uh, programme. Uh, I've got uh, Julie Francis, Head of Commercial Services, your hand is up. Thanks, Mary. And it's just really to echo some of the things that Claire has already said. I was involved at a, at a strategic and operational le level with regards to this project. And I think a key factor for that success was everyone was very clear in terms of their roles and responsibilities and obligations um, to ensure that success. Thank you. Yes, Julie. Thank you. Um, so a successful uh, um, project all round and good to receive that substantial overall uh, assurance uh, on the data centre project move. Uh, if there aren't any other questions or observations, can I thank Carwin, Gaidiochichdi Carwin, our team hefyd a chan gyfarchu um, ar y gwaith ar y project yma uh, uh, and uh, our congratulations as Audit Committee and our thanks to Carwin and the team for delivering successfully this uh, data centre project move. Diolch yn fawr. We'll move on then to the next uh, uh, audit report, which is Governance Arrangements Part 2. Um, and I'll hand over back to uh, Internal Audit then, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Stephen is going to pick this up, but he has just disappeared from my screen. Oh, so... I'm, I'm oh you are there. I do apologise, Stephen. <laughs> Definitely here. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this review was the second part of uh, an overall governance arrangements suite of audits this, this year. The, the first one focused on the standing orders and SFIs and whether those requirements were being implemented. This one was more of a, a consolidated review of performance management uh, strategy and, uh, and, and risk management. And the reason for this was because of those key areas were still very much underway and in development. So we uh, pitched the audit from that perspective, really. Uh, within next year's plan, we're looking to focus on individual components again in, in more detail as DHCW becomes established. And, and, and overall, uh, we actually found a very good position. It, it came out as a, a strong, reasonable, and, and, and whilst uh, we found what we expected or hoped to find, uh, there were some areas for improvement. And, and certainly around the strategic objectives and the IMTP as a whole, um, this was good. Um, but we did raise questions around whether the objectives still remain valid, uh, uh, you know, not just the overall objectives, the programme of work as well. So we, we did recommend that this is reviewed uh, to ensure it still reflects what uh, the vision of DHCW is. And, uh, and likewise, around performance management, we saw good reporting in place uh, with the uh, in integrated performance report. And we suggested that maybe these uh, reporting tools link a bit more clearly to the strategic objectives of DHCW. Um, also, uh, alongside that, any key messages coming out from the reporting that it, it's tailored for, for the audience as well. I think one of the reports we found was about 35 pages. So some of the key messages and themes being brought out. We understand that this was already uh, being looked at, but um, it, it's a, a recommendation that we picked up on. And alongside that, what's the health and care standards may not apply to the same extent as other health organisations within Wales. They're nonetheless still uh, an important part. And, uh, yeah, and we suggested that the requirements of healthcare standards are considered with uh, reporting as well. And you know, not least because whilst the governance and accountability overarching module is uh, very important, um, there are responsibilities with um, other clients within uh, NHS Wales as well, where they do have standards that apply to them. And in turn, DHCW may also have that responsibility as well. So it, we do feel it's an integral part of, um, of all organisations within NHS Wales. And the, uh, the final point was around uh, risk management. Um, again, it was good. We've seen, we saw, uh, seen a lot of work that's uh, taking place and underway. 
and uh, we focused quite heavily on the BAF, the Board Assurance Framework, and we looked at the timeline of this and how challenging it, it may have been. So we recommended that in order to deliver on that, that again, the programme of work and the resources required are suitable to, uh, to meet um, the ambitions of the organisation as well. But overall, as I said, it's a very good progress considering it's the first full year. Thank you. Any questions? Dear Stephen, uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I can't see any hands up, but I'd be uh, keen to bring in uh, our board secretary, uh, Chris Darling. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add at this point, Chris, in response to the findings of uh, the audit report? Thanks, Chair. I I, I think my observation would be it's very much a snapshot of our moment in time as an organisation. So it's, it, you know, the audit took place six to nine months after our establishment. Um, and there are areas within the recommendations and within the areas being examined that we are developing, as Stephen mentioned. Uh, from a risk and BAF perspective, I think, it, you know, it's an ongoing process for us as an organisation. We will mature, we've had these discussions, we'll mature, grow, develop as time um, goes on. Um, so it'd be interesting to monitor that. And I think the fact that we've got audits planned this year in those specific areas is helpful for us to kind of track some of that change and growth. Um, a, a number of the areas fall into Michelle's uh, uh, area of responsibility. So Michelle might want to comment as well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Michelle, would you like to come in on this point? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I guess with the planning and performance hat on, um, I'm pleased to say actually a number of the actions, and I think it's reflected in the report, we have been able to address uh, already. As Chris said, it was a bit of a reflection on where we were in timing, and it was really helpful that the board had the opportunity to spend a lot more time thinking about the IMTP uh, that we submitted uh, for this year than we did uh, last year, obviously, when the board wasn't actually in place uh, when we had to finalise the IMTP. So. Um, we have had board development sessions and agreed a kind of vision and mission and, and certainly um, confirmed the strategic objectives, which I think puts us in a much better position as we move forward into this year now. Uh, the performance report, also an area I, that I lead on, we are continuing to refine that, I think it would be fair to say. So we'll reset now for the new IMTP and the, uh, the objectives that have been set out. Um, and we'll, we're continuing, we've got some sessions in the diary to continue to work with the board really to to really hone that, I think, in terms of the key messaging. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a work in progress. Thanks. Dear Michelle, thank you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle Sell, of course, is our Chief Operating uh, Officer. Uh, I'll turn now then to Ruth Glazard. You've got your hand up. Dioch Marion, I just wondered if um, Michelle perhaps could comment a little bit more about the healthcare standards piece and how we think we might um, it, we might merge that in where where relevant, I guess, is the is the key bit, and we call out where it's not. Shall I respond on that, Chair? Yes, I think relevance and and to be fair, colleagues had uh, mentioned that as they were presenting the report. So obviously, as we're not providing care. Um, a number of the standards are, are uh, less relevant or perhaps a bit arm's length to the services that we provide, but not irrelevant. Perhaps I should be careful how I say that. So I think that is a task that we're looking at now with the with the performance team is to understand, OK, so of the ones that are most applicable to the services that we deliver, how will we reflect those in the performance report? So I am expecting that to be in the performance report as we go forward. And I think, again, it's another area that we'll probably want to work on over the next year to make sure that we've got the right level of um, priority, really, and visibility against those standards as an organisation. Yeah. Dear Michelle, um, Chris. Yeah, it's just on that point as well on the healthcare standards. I think one of um, when we look through, you know, when we did the self-assessment this year, obviously we we marked a number not not applicable. I think we had the discussion that next year the number that won't be applicable will probably reduce um, over time. I think the more public citizen facing work that we do directly will increase the number of standards that become applicable to us. Likewise, as we get more into the medical devices uh, area of work, more will become applicable. So it's an area for us to keep a, a close eye on, I think, as we move forward. Thank you, Chris. Um, Ruth, uh, you want to come in again? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chris. I think it's worth just at this point stating the link for um, CDPS, Centre for Digital Public Services. They've got a new head of standards in place and obviously they are looking at how they deliver um, in the health, potentially in the health space and what they look at there. So there will be some connections, Michelle, that I, I'll be wanting to make with their new head of standards and our standards team um, to see if there's anything that they can be doing to to help support us in um, as, as we move forward looking at different sets of standards. Um, so we'll have a we'll have a conversation about that outside of this meeting. So uh, thank you. And of course, Ruth sits uh, on behalf of DHCW on, on that board. So so thank you for, for that clarity. Uh, so overall, reasonable assurance, which is pleasing to note, a point in time um, and uh, there will be further audits uh, uh, reflecting, I'm sure, the fact that uh, this governance journey is very much work in progress and we will see that work evolving over the coming months and look forward to seeing the future audits uh, on uh, on this area. So thank you all for that. We'll move on then to the system development audit and uh, Mayron George is here as well to respond to any questions or queries but I'll hand up first, hand over first to uh, uh, internal audit if I may. Uh, thanks, Chair. Martin will pick this one up. Hey, um, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, this was um, an audit on systems development. Uh, the overall purpose was to provide assurance over the process in place for developments. The key objectives we covered in the audit were looking at the procedures and guidelines, um, looking at the training and skills in place within the department, looking at the design process and links to the user needs, looking at the development process and then following on to um, testing and the de deployment process and then the ongoing maintenance of the uh, systems in place. The outcome of the report is that it's a reasonable assurance overall. Um, there's plenty of good practice in place and there's procedures and guidelines um, available for staff. And in general, there are good processes in place and developments um, are undertaken appropriately and match the identified user needs. The development process um, is agile um, and it can be tracked from the user request uh, through the design process um, to the final product with there's um, a, a proper quality assurance and review process in place and um, testing is undertaken on all the code that's been developed. And there's um, a controlled deployment mechanism to make sure it gets rolled out safely and securely without causing any issues. Um, there were three um, main findings within the report. Uh, the first one is that although training needs are identified within the department, um, the training isn't always provided to staff. Um, so there is a skills gap in place within the department overall. Um, it's slightly compounded by the quite large number of vacancies within the department, but I know there are kind of plans in place to kind of resolve that. And you have bought a new kind of software training service, basically, which um, will free that up a bit. Um, we also note there, there are some differences between the various teams um, involved in development. Uh, one of those is that changes to the source um, and stored procedures code um, within WRIS are down to the support staff and outside the remit of the development team. So there's um, some loss of code control there. Um, and finally, although security is considered as part of the development process, it's not fully integrated into the process in its entirety. Um, there's no process for um, code review by security um, and there isn't or there wasn't a, a proper checklist to make sure security is formally considered at each stage. Um, so we discussed these issues with management and we have identified you know, there's agreed actions in place to um, resolve it and take it forward. So overall reasonable assurance and I'm happy to take any questions. Dear Martin, thank you. Uh... Are there any questions? Uh, I can see a hand up, although I'm not entirely sure whose hand that is. So uh, do please. Mind, Mario. Thank you, David. Do come in. Uh, yeah, apologies for not introducing myself. My internet connection dropped out just at the vital time, so apologies for that. A uh, couple of questions, please. Um, um, the report refers to using an agile methodology. Um, uh, I, I'm just clarifying whether we've got any legacy projects that are still using Waterfall or whether we've completed those. So that's a point of clarification. And then the second is a question around the level of vacancies. 
Um, has that got worse since this time last year in terms of the percentage shortfall of staff we've got? And if it persists, have we got some assessment of the impact to um, programmes we've got covered in our IMTP this year? Sean. David. Martin, do you want to come in initially on the uh, uh, that first point? Um, I, I couldn't answer that question because this is more about the ongoing development rather than specific projects. So who's looking at is our systems being developed? So I, I couldn't tell you whether or not there's legacy projects using the waterfall. My suspicion is probably no, but I guess uh, mine chair, is probably better. Chair, can I come in there, please? Uh, the answer is no, uh, to, to, to David's point. Can I move on as well to that recruitment issue? Okay. Uh, ADS of 23% more staff in post now than they did this time last year. I think part of our difficulty is and our ongoing difficulty is the expansion of of the remit of DHCW and the, and the programs we have and trying to keep pace with that. So well, there's lots of things going on behind the scenes in respect to that, particularly from uh, our workforce colleagues, but also we, we're not looking at recruitment. We're looking at capacity planning going forward. So it's actually recruiting staff. We are using more um, third parties. We are using contractors because we have to at this point in time. Uh, but we do measure that ability to create that capacity against the expectations of the IMTP. So the IMTP does not assume, for example, we're going to have a 100% fill rate between now and the end of the year. So we do temper that expectation. So um, although it is a difficult situation, as you know, uh, we are revising with workforce colleagues the job descriptions. We are taking um, non-pay benefits of employment with DHCW as part of our offering, and that appears to be having some success from the new channels we've got, particularly via LinkedIn and CV Library, where we get a lot more applicants looking at the, uh, the, the, the non-pay advantages of coming to DHCW. Pension, culture is a big issue uh, working for DHCW. Uh, the training opportunities, which to be fair to the work that Martin's team done here, Historically, we haven't been where we should have been, but you know, certainly as far as our um, training plan and training needs analysis, that is up to date. Our training matrix in respect of all the jobs we have have now been completed and we're aligned in the expectations uh, of the skill set we want for people against all those roles. And as part of the budget setting process for 22-23, in conjunction with Claire, we've allocated more money within uh, ADS for targeted training to address some of the de uh, skills deficits we got. So there's quite a lot going behind the behind the scenes. I suppose the two key issues for me coming out of this is, yes, we need to make security issue integral to our systems development, and that's something we got, we're going to be looking to address. And the professional uh, development skills pathway needs to be developed. However, I think you all agree we need to do that in con conjunction with Gareth Davis now who's now appointed as a new executive lead and we'll be addressing that with him quite shortly to take his uh, his take on the things. Now we take things forward uh, from your in and address the recommendations of this report. Dear Marianne, thank you. Does, does that answer your question, David? Uh, yes, it does. Thanks, um, Marianne. And um, I'm pleased to note that we're making more use of strategic suppliers to, to uh, undertake work, which is uh, one way of solving the, the challenge we've got. And I'm pleased to know that we've actually increased headcount since last year. So we're, we're moving in the right direction, just struggling with the prevailing market conditions for people with these type of skills. So um, yeah, thank which, you for that. Which is why, David, we have to we have to fight on a non-pay basis because agenda for change isn't competitive with the open market. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, skills shortages, staff vacancies are are clearly articulated on our risk register along with the uh, mitigating actions and no doubt we'll come back to that uh, uh, in, in due course this morning. Um, that appears to be the all the comments and questions, Marion, so thank you for joining us this morning. No problem. And it is pleasing once again to uh, receive that overall reasonable assurance with the caveats that clearly uh, has been uh, outlined. So we note uh, the overall reasonable assurance on the system development audit uh, and move on therefore to our fourth audit which is the core financials um, and uh, Claire Osmonds and Little uh, will be here as well to respond uh, uh, at the end of uh, uh, internal audits presentation. Who's taking this last uh, audit then? Uh, Stephen Wilchair. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, yes, I'm picking up core financials and like the uh, previous audit around part two of corporate governance arrangements, um, this is something that's uh, well to a degree still in development but overall we did raise a number of recommendations but uh, it was still a very strong reasonable overall as well um, some of these recommendations as previously um, have already been worked upon and are in the process of being addressed or have been uh, addressed and as you may have seen some of the recommendations are very much focusing around enhancing current controls so we, we we looked at um literally quite a broad remit with this one from financial control procedures through to the budget control arrangements banking environments uh, procurement and agency as well um the financial control procedures uh, are very good uh, very strong and yeah, we provided substantial assurance over that area. On the budgetary control side, um, it, it was good overall, um, but there are some recommendations coming out. So again, uh, linking through to the requirements of the SFIs, maybe the reporting uh, can be improved around that. So these are the requirements of DHCW. How are they being monitored and reported? on uh, likewise some of the budget holder uh, budget holder meetings as well uh, there is a requirement where there are variances that these meetings take place and uh, and actions undertaken and and, and we saw you know, an, an area for improvement there as well and one of the key tools that budget holders can use is something called uh, power bi uh, we spoke to 10 individuals as, as part of the review and uh, and you know nine of them don't routinely use it uh, and likewise you know five of them admitted that they wouldn't necessarily know how to use it so there's a bit of an opportunity for improvement there to give budget holders you know they have the tools um but to be actively encouraged or enabled to use that tool to look at variances because uh, picking up on the point that was raised just now there is um there is a gap in terms of recruitment because of the workforce challenges, and this has led to uh, an underspend across the organisation as well. And for this year only, it, you know, we were informed that uh, you know, any underspend should be used for training, maybe software upgrades. Uh, so that there's um, a role there that could be uh, improved upon to ensure that money is being uh, spent or put to, to the best use. Um, Alongside that, we, we had a look at uh, a couple of the other financial controls, uh, environments in particular. Um, they went uh, they went a huge number of environments, uh, and uh, these are transfers between cost centres. Uh, but when one should um, when when environment does take place, um, you know, there should, there's a process to go through, including uh, authorisation. And you know, and we were informed that this was happening, but the audit trail could be what we felt could be in, in improved upon to give that evidence of direct uh, sign off. Uh, and likewise, on the bank reconciliations, as you would expect, it's a key part of the financial statements and the monthly reporting. Um, this is taking place, the reconciliations are there. Um, we just recommended that a review is completed and evidence of that review is completed. Again, there's nothing to suggest that the re review isn't taking place. Indeed, we were told it was. It's just the evidence demonstrating that particular point. And um, finally, oh, nearly finally, we looked at procurement, uh, particularly over um, expenditure of £5,000. And we looked at a sample of single, single tender actions as well that uh, took place. And uh, and we found no issues uh, overall with that. It it came out extremely well. It was substantial assurance for that particular area as well. But when we did look at um, the use of agency staff, um, like most organisations within NHS Wales, there is a Crown Commercial Services Agreement in place. This puts a particular set of requirements and onus on the agency to undertake pre-employment checks when supplying a candidate uh, and and it is quite a, a detailed list and we found that there isn't any assurance being received that those checks are being fully completed um you know, we, you know we're sure that the elements of it are being completed in terms of references etc but 
we don't have complete confidence that all of it is being done. Um, so overall, it's nothing huge, hugely significant, uh, but there are a few areas uh, for improvement going forward. So welcome any questions. Thank you. Dear Stephen for um, uh, uh, giving us a, a, a brief resume of your findings. Um, I'll turn to Claire Osmondson Little um, to respond because I'm sure she'll want to make some observations um, with particular regard to some of the comments that you've made. Claire. Yeah, thank you. And and thanks uh, for the observations from the inter from the report. I think it's true to say that um, they were really helpful because, as, as you can imagine, we're a new organisation. We're not fully up to uh, full recruitment yet, um, but there are certainly areas that we need to sharpen on, in, uh, particularly around our directorate reporting, in being more consistent in terms of some of the directorate reporting that we do. Uh, and equally, from an exact level down, showing trend analysis, um, we do have it, we just didn't share it. And I think for me, it's just reminding us of our responsibilities around the SFIs uh, and being far more succinct and, and, and far more exact. And also, I think we have developed a SharePoint site or developing a SharePoint site so that we can demonstrate that uh, consistency across the directorates and work with the directorates to ensure that the budget holders are very um, uh, familiar with, with their tools, but equally are able to see those trends and analysis. And the final thing in terms of BI, it is a relatively new tool for us uh, within DHEW uh, and we've championed it within the digital um, finance teams. Uh, and I think that just goes to show with a relatively new team, enabling them to have time to learn their roles and develop those skills will certainly be a priority for us going forward. Um, so I think it's helped us sharpen our game uh, and, uh, and uh, we've uh, undertaken many of the, the actions um, that um, that were recommended already, um, and and I and I suppose um, I'm going to just ask um, Mark whether there was anything else he would like to add as he as he obviously takes a, a pivotal role in managing that uh, that team. Dear Claire, um, Mark, would you like to come in? Thanks, Claire. Yes, and 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 just to um, underscore that it, the audit was very useful. Um, particularly in terms that um, uh, we've obviously implemented and rolled out Power BI as the dashboard of choice and, and the reporting mechanism of choice. And it really was interesting not only to hear the, um, the internal, internal audit perspective, but also the response from a survey we'd already um, put in place in terms of improvement and, um, and possible training. So it, it does dovetail with um, the actions that were underway in the exercises which were underway prior to the internal audit. So it's, it's good to note that I guess we're on the same page from, from that perspective. And and also to to effectively underscore that um, the recommendations, you know, we didn't let the grass go under our feet. We we immediately um, looked to address that, and 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 you can see that uh, um, in terms of the last SHA report, which we promoted some of the detail which is supplied to the management board in terms of trend, in terms of run rates to the actual um, SHA board reporting suite. Um, so yes, um, it's welcomed. Um, it was um, heartening to see we had substantial assurance around the financial control procedures. But uh, as Claire's mentioned, um, there's always improvement, and um, uh, th this is um, part of the service improvement that's underway within finance as we speak. Dear Mark, uh, thank you. Um, I can see that Ruth has a question. Uh, Dear, thank you, thank you, Marion. Um, it, it, Claire and Claire and Mark, as as I expected, have partly really answered my question. I think this was a, this was a really good report. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, you could see that it was just about some tweaks to consistency. Um, and I'm I'm really pleased with the management response that we that we received in this pack around that. Um, I was also pleased to see the substantial assurance around the single tender um, actions in procurement, um, which if people will know I frequently comment on. Um, so that was that was really good to see. I do have one question about budget holders though. Um, I'm sure our budget holders are delighted to be having May as their Power BI month. Um, but my question is, you know, because people can, you can teach people to use a system, but do our budget holders uh, traditionally actively manage their budgets or do they, is it just a, well, it's their finance will tell us? So um, 
obviously there's a variation on that one. It's a good question. Thank you, Ruth, and thanks for the feedback. Um, we have regular directorate reviews and we also have budget hold individual reviews. So each budget holder has a responsibility. They sign that off at the beginning of the year that they understand that what those responsibilities are. Are they pre pre preactive or reactive when they see their budget statements? I think I'm not sure if Carwin's still here. If you're underspent, then I think, you know, equally you should spend as much more um, uh, rigor to understand why you're underspend, but you tend to find when you're overspent, it hits the radar. So we try to do both. Um, and as um, as you know from our management accounts and, and, our, and our reporting, um, I think it depends in the area that you're in, and it also depends on the maturity that we're developing um, within our governance process throughout DHCW. I think traditionally it was seen as it was finances problem, and we've taken it from that to actually trying strategically for the budget holders to understand their budgets and their spend, understand the drivers of that spend, and try and look at it um, through not just an operational uh, lens, but through a business partner, through a, a more of a strategic lens. So, you know, try to understand, is that a sustainable cost pressure that we're going to need to resolve as an organisation? Or is that something we could look and whether through procurement or through through efficiencies, uh, drive that benefit? So I'd love to say, if I'm honest, that we had a very mature financially um, business driven uh, budget holder um, population. I think we'll get there. Um, but we're not quite there yet. So I think it's a combination of working together with procurement, with finance, but also with our planning and workforce colleagues to try and truly understand what the resources that we use are and what they cost and how we can efficient, efficiently work together to optimise them and redelegate gains, uh, but also try and manage overspends in, in a more of a strategic mindset rather than a reactionary operational one. So um, we've got a long way to go, but we've started that 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 journey, really. Dear Claire, um, and I can see that Mark Cox would, would like to come in. Is it on this specific point, Mark? It, it is, Marion, and, and it's just underscoring that again. Um, you know, it, there is variability on the patch uh, roof and um, certain budgets um, uh, have different levels of complexity. And uh, the more complex the budget, the more drawn the budget holder is into the sorts of um, uh, communications with finance. And uh, effectively, we're trying to have consistency across the patches, as Claire said, and bring everybody up to that particular level. And um, uh, and, and, and that's part of our training. That's part of the, the, the sort of brief we're going to give. Thank you. Um, I can see that there is another hand up, although I can't exactly see on my screen whose hand that is. It's, um, it's me, Marion, Julie Francis. Julie, do, do come in, Julie. Yes, sorry um, about that. That's OK, Marion. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Stephen's point in relation to the checks being undertaken around agency contractors. Those are now being built. That's now being built into the process that we're conducting. So thanks. Thank you for that confirmation, Julie. And uh, I'm pleasing to note that uh, uh, a number of actions are underway as a direct response of the recommendations in this audit, which underlines how helpful these audits are in terms of our journey of improvement as, as a brand new organisation. So uh, our thanks to our internal audit colleagues. Um, and unless there are any other observations or questions, um, I just like to note that we are receiving all four resort reports for uh, assurance. Um, and I'd like to formally thank Internal Audit uh, for the uh, way they've conducted the audits, which has been uh, extremely helpful uh, as we move forward. So thank you, and we'll move on to the Internal Audit Plan for 22-23, which you have in your papers. Simon? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, so obviously um, at the next meeting we'll, we'll bring those last couple of reports and the full end of your opinion, which then gives you the full suite uh, of assurance for 21-22, but the assurance process is a continual process and we go through the annual planning process and agree a plan with you uh, for the coming year. Uh, you have that plan. I will uh, assume the plan has been read, but it's in, in three parts. It takes you through 
the process uh, that we have followed, uh, which is in line with the public sector internal audit standards. It then sets out, starting on, on page 125 of your papers, the actual plan for 22-23, the areas uh, that we've identified, linked where appropriate to uh, corporate and key risks uh, of the organisation. But worth pointing out that in the area of estates compliance, we'll agree the full formal scope of that review uh, a little bit later on. And we've done some further work on that and uh, we'll bring that back to the committee uh, in due course. Uh, we've picked up the point around having a smoother uh, program of work this year and that's that's included in the indicative uh, timings there as well. Uh, so the plan, as I say, sets out the, the rationale that we followed. It sets out the plan in Appendix A. Uh, it gives you then also uh, our current key performance indicators and also the internal audit charter, which sets out effectively the relationship between you and us uh, in terms of uh, working going forward. It's set out uh, very much in the same way as you received last year. We've made some mm -hmm. tweaks to the wording, uh, which has gone through the board secretaries and uh, a subgroup of that uh, that that I work with. Um, and we ask you to approve the plan, to approve the audit charter, and to note that we are telling you we have the resources to complete the work so that you're not agreeing a plan we can't um, uh, deliver. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable to go into as much detail as you would like, but I'll, on the assumption that you've you've signed off plans before, we have, you know, we have talked about this yes. previously. Uh, very happy to to stop there and, and open it up to um, to questions or comments. Dear Simon, uh, thank you. And as you say, there have been extensive discussions around the formulation of this plan, um, and I know colleagues have had ample time to consider it. Um, I'm going to bring in Michelle uh, Sell, our uh, Chief Operating Officer. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy. It's, it's a very comprehensive, very helpful plan. Simon, it's a minor point of accuracy uh, from my perspective in Appendix A in relation to the specific audits proposed. You mentioned you were working on the estate strategy. It's actually assigned to the Chief Operating Officer. So there's a degree of personal interest here. The Director of Finance, I'd be happy to hand that one to who's the exec lead for, uh, for estates. So just a minor update, I think, on detail. Um, well, thank you, Michelle. And if the committee's happy, we'll make that um, update to the document but um, and, and leave it up to you whether you want the document to come back again. But uh, we can update that along with the specific focus of that review when that brief is agreed. I think on the basis of that, we, we, we are happy to uh, uh, make that decision today on the basis of what is uh, before us uh, with that uh, particular amendment. Uh, I can't see any other questions or queries, so I think uh, we are being asked to uh, approve, as Simon said, the internal audit plan for 2022-23, approve the internal audit charter, uh, and noting the associated resource requirements and KPIs, which you have before you uh, in uh, agenda item 3.3 uh, uh, and 3.4. So I will take it that we've approved that plan and look forward to yep. uh, uh, reports uh, and uh, the audits being conducted, uh, which, as you say, are more front loaded. Uh, there's more of a consistency of timing uh, with regard to this plan than was uh, clearly possible uh, in uh, the, the last uh, year in question. So thank you, Simon, for that. And thank you, internal audit colleagues, for your contributions and observations uh, uh, this morning. Um, I uh, will turn now to uh, the next part of our agenda item, which is the Audit Wales uh, Committee update report, agenda item 3.5. And um, it's my pleasure now to invite Darren Griffiths, uh, the Audit Manager, to present uh, Audit Wales's update, which uh, includes the Welsh Minister's uh, uh, direction that uh, DHCW will prepare a 15-month set of financial statements to 31st March 22. Um, and uh, Appendix 1 there, you'll see useful key messages from uh, recent key publications uh, including the joint working between uh, emergency services. Uh, this report is coming to the Audit Committee for Assurance, and uh, I will hand over then to Darren Griffiths. Darren. 
Dechwari awn, Marian. Bore da bawb. Good morning, everyone. Um, my colleague Mike will cover the financial audit update, and I'll just take you quickly through the, the other sections of the report. Um, so there is no performance audit update because we have completed and reported on the baseline governance review. Um, that was the only piece of performance audit work in the 2021 audit plan. Um, in terms of GPX, which is our good practice exchange programme, there have been no events since we last reported to the committee um, in January. However, uh, we have launched a, uh, a, a new programme called um, COVID-19 Perspectives, where we have interviewed um, colleagues from across the public sector uh, to invite them to share their experiences of the impact of um, COVID-19 um, on the way public services are governed and delivered um, and the board secretary kindly agreed to be interviewed um, as part of this programme. Um, we are uh, releasing the interviews uh, gradually over the next couple of months um, and we will share the link um, to the interview with Chris as soon as it becomes available but just really want to thank Chris for agreeing to participate um, on behalf of DHE W in the in the program. Um, as the chair has noted, there is a summary of a national report um, on joint working between emergency services. So the key messages are set out in Appendix One. Um, however, since publishing our update, we have also released a blog on um, the pressures in the unscheduled care system. Uh, now, whilst not directly relevant to DHCW, um, it does mark the beginning of our work across um, the relevant health bodies on system pressures within unscheduled care. Um, and we will be undertaking further work um, and any relevant key messages um, will be shared or reported um, to this committee. Um, and as Chris mentioned earlier, in terms of WCCIS, um, we have prepared a draft update uh, letter to the Public um, Accounts and Public Administration Committee. Um, the draft has been shared with colleagues at the HEW for clearance. Um, and as soon as the update has been considered by the committee, we will bring it here for your information. Um, I'll now hand over to Mike, who will provide an update on our financial audit work. Thank you. Dear Darren. Uh, thank you, Darren. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair. Um, just to briefly take you through the financial update section there, uh, as, as previously mentioned, we now have the accounts direction issued from Welsh Government, which confirms the 15 month set of accounts that's fo uh, following from 30th of December 2020 to 31st of March 2022 with that first period up until the 1st of April 21 being the shadow form period, no formal resource allocations uh, were given to DHW in that period. Um, but for completeness, the accounting period needs to cover the, the full 15 months. So, so you'll see that as a, a link to the risk in the financial audit section in the audit plan coming up next on the agenda. Um, the audit of the financial balances transferred from Valindre has now been complete. There were no issues arising from the transfer of that. So they've finished their side of it from our side of it as a DHCW audit team. We're now kind of doing our work on confirming those opening balances have been correctly reflected in the ledger uh, and appropriately allocated, uh, but work completed to date has not indicated any issues with that. Happy to report. Um, finally, in paragraph four there, uh, the deadline for the draft financial statements was Friday last week, happy to report uh, the accounts are received in advance of that deadline, albeit half an hour in advance of the, the noon deadline, but um, <laughs> still earlier than most I've received, to be honest. So that's a really positive, um, a really positive kind of uh, issue there. And you know, my thanks to Mark and Sean and, and the wider finance team, a significant achievement for them in terms of getting those accounts to us and also all the supporting working papers ready for us on that day as well, um, which is really helpful for us as an audit team because that means the audit starts in earnest well Friday afternoon and continues this morning um so again just to express my thanks there um I thought it's probably just worth reflecting chair if I may just just on the positive relationships that we've developed with the finance team um coming new to the audit in January um yeah it's been really positive 
really engaging and you know the team are open with us coming to us with any potential issues or questions or not no problems i can't say they come to us with any problems but just really happy that they feel they can come to us with anything any questions and um, we've been working through those in the run-up to the accounts i think that's really helped the process happy to take any questions thank you mike and that's really pleasing to hear your positive observations especially about the openness and the positive relation that uh, the relationship that's been developed between you and the finance team uh, and on, on that note i will bring uh, the deputy director of finance in uh, mark cox thank you chair and and thank you mike i'm, I'm not i'm not going to go into detail because i know there's a, a separate agenda item but um just for, to reciprocate, I think Claire, myself and Sean, uh, you know, we vow to be completely transparent and um, obviously that, that can go into some gory detail at times. But I think our sort of weekly sessions are extremely helpful. Um, they helped us deliver the draft accounts on time, as you as you mentioned, and um, I think we've um, we've obviously given the heads up in terms of um, areas, I guess, you would like to um, to, to to focus on as part of this this um, this audit, and um, um, we, we hope it carries on in a, in a similar vein. But, uh, thank you, Mike. Dear Mark, um, Claire. Yeah, um, thank you for your feedback, Mike. It's really um, heartwarming, actually, because it is a it is the hardest and toughest couple of weeks we've had in the finance team to get everything done complete and, and they're all new forms so it's it's pretty new to us all in terms of completion. One observation though for, for me having done work closely with the team is is the the importance of digital and and looking through the accounts and the way they're structured and the way that they're formatted is is how sometimes challenging that can be uh, because digital is relatively modern, relatively new, and the data structures and the way we analyse our data and classify it um, d does does create some insights and 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 some challenges. I think to really reflect the true uh, essence of what we're trying to report. So something perhaps not for today, but you know, as we go through this process, is it, this is a new digital organisation, um, and using your experience and broader um, insights, really to really look and reflect on how do we reflect that financially in our accounts um, so that any reader can really understand, I suppose, um, what we've done, where we spent it and how efficient and effective that's been really. Um, so I think it's the start of a, a new journey, a new chapter, um, but um, I welcome your feedback and I'll feed that back to the team um, back at base. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and uh, um, a timely challenge there for uh, ourselves as an organisation. And um, clearly there is scope for support from Audit Wales in, in, in this regard. Um, Ruth Glazard, you have a question. Uh, deal. Thank you, Marion. Um, I think it's good news to hear about the, the positive working relationships there between the between the teams. That's always that's always helpful to hear. And um, I had a, a slightly different question actually about the information sharing piece and the post COVID um, the post COVID interviews and the information that's being gathered and shared there. Um, are we capturing? Because obviously a big part of the post COVID world now, well, living with COVID, I suppose is the fact that we're in a, a cost of living crisis and that's going to start having a bigger and bigger impact on our staff as well as on uh, you know people who use the wider the wider nhs and i just wondered for, from our audit colleagues are we picking up any of those themes in some of these information sharing uh, sessions and how are we how are we passing on that that learning Thank you, Ruth. Um, it's a, a fairly recent uh, issue in terms of the last few months, but uh, it's a, a pertinent challenge from, from Ruth. Um, who would like to take this, uh, Mike or Darren? Um, I'm happy to take that question, Chair. Yeah. Um, I, I think in terms of the the perspectives on COVID-19, um, I think they're, they're covering a very broad range of subjects. Um, but, you know, we will definitely be undertaking um, a high level analysis of the key themes coming out of that work. Um, but also, I think it's important to know that we've also recently been consulting on the Auditor General's programme of work um, for the next couple of years. Um, and um, the, the programme of work has indicated, you know, a desire to look at inequalities 
um, and the impact of poverty, um, you know, in terms of 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 on term, in terms of our communities. Um, so there, there's a possibility there to to uh, assess the impact of the cost of living crisis and the way public services, um, both singularly and collectively, can work together to ameliorate. Uh, some of the effects of the cost of living crisis on people and communities in Wales. Um, so there are opportunities through the Auditor General's uh, programme of audit work to explore those issues in more depth. Thank you. I think that I think that's helpful, and it's clear around um, how we might start to assess that for the communities that we support. Um, I guess the the thing I don't want to lose is you know our our largest community that we start with is our staff. And 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 that in and of itself will will bring challenges to the people who work for us, not just the people that we deliver services for. Dear Ruth, thanks for for raising that. Uh, uh, dear Darren, thank you for uh, highlighting the work that is underway, which will be clearly a very helpful point of reference uh, going going forward. I can't see any other hands up. Um, uh, any other questions before I draw this discussion? to a close. If not, then I'd just like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Claire and the team for what is a significant achievement, I think, in delivering the accounts. Uh, as Claire rightly highlighted, it's been a challenging couple of weeks, but you've, you've got there and uh, delivered. And it's been really pleasing to hear about the positive relationship that's developed between DHCW and uh, the, 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 the team at audit Wales. So congratulations to the team and I hope uh, you will indeed take back those messages uh, to your teams uh, after this uh, audit committee. So we are being asked to receive the report for assurance which we do and and have done. Uh, Diolch, Darren and, and Mike. So let's move forward then to the Audit Wales plan for 2022. Um, again, uh, we've had an opportunity to uh, consider the audit plan in advance of today's meeting, colleagues around the table, uh, there have been discussions, um, but I'd like to invite Darren to present the plan, uh, which sets out Audit Wales's programme uh, of work at the HCW uh, for the coming year. Darren. Uh, um, so as the chair has mentioned, the audit plan sets out um, our programme of work during 2022 in relation to auditing the HEW's uh, financial statements, as well as reviewing the organisation's arrangements for securing economy efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, the plan sets out uh, the estimated fee for 2022, details of the audit timetable, as well as details of the audit team. Um, I'll provide a very high level overview of the uh, planned performance audit work before handing over to Mike, um, who will talk a bit more about um, the arrangements for auditing the financial uh, statements. Um, so you'll see we, we plan to undertake three pieces of performance audit work at the organisation. The first is the structured assessment. Um, so as you're aware, we completed a baseline governance review um, last year and this year you will be subject to a full uh, structured assessment at the organisation, but building very much on the work um, undertaken as part of the baseline governance review. Um, the structured assessment will focus on the arrangements in relation to governance and leadership, um, financial planning, uh, strategic planning and use of resources. Um, we'll also be undertaking a thematic piece of work at DHCW and at other NHS bodies as well, um, looking specifically at workforce risks and how the organisation's workforce planning arrangements um, are being used to take forward those workforce risks in the short, medium and longer term. So there will be an individual report prepared for the HCW, but we will also be looking at opportunities to compare and contrast um, arrangements across different NHS bodies, as well as to identify uh, key themes um, uh, nationally to inform a supplementary output. Um, and there's also scope within the fee to undertake a bespoke local piece of audit work um, at DHCW. And we've already started um, discussing the, the precise focus of this work with Chris and other executive colleagues. Um, and we will be bringing forward 
um, the proposals um, hopefully to the next um, audit committee meeting. Um, we are very conscious of the need not to duplicate um, work and efforts, particularly in terms of the work um, internal audit colleagues are undertaking. Um, so it will be um, aligned to the strategic risks of the organisation, but focusing on a different area of work. Um, I'll now hand over to, to Mike, if I can. Thank you, Chair. Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think kind of in in going through the financial aspects of the plan, um, I was proposing just to kind of tease out some of the risks in the financial statements risk table at Exhibit 1, which starts on page 167 of the agenda papers, just to get, give a little bit more context around some of those uh, that might not seem um, that familiar if you've not been through a, an external audit process before, if I may. Um, just taking the first risk there, risk of management overrider controls, that is a prescribed risk under the auditing standards that is applicable to all bodies. So any audit plan, uh, any financial audit plan you will look at will have that in. We're not able to rebut that. Um, all that is kind of larger saying is if management wanted to override controls, they could because they're management. That's all it's saying. So it's saying you, we need to be kind of recognising that in our work and ensure we're undertaking sufficient work to address that risk. Uh, as mentioned in the update paper, we've got a risk there on the 15 month set of accounts. So we felt it was appropriate to reflect that as a risk in the plan here just because, well, it's unusual. We don't normally expect to see a 15 month set of accounts. Um, you know, there are understandably some elements of risk around that, um, but as I've kind of alluded to earlier, happy to report we've not got any concerns over that at this stage. We just need to work through that now from looking at the guidance from Welsh Government, looking at the accounts direction and working through that with the accounts templates that have been provided by Welsh Government. On to the next page. Probably just pick out IFRS 16 leases. So that's a new accounting standard that's coming in next year. Um, but some disclosure information needs to be included in this year's set of accounts in terms of just flagging that potential impact. What could the changes be kind of coming forward? Um, review of the accounts confirms that um, that information has been produced. There was a risk there that um, we might not have had sufficient background information on the number of leases, might not have had sufficient detail on the nature of the leases and so on. Um, we've not done any work on that yet, but pleasing to see that that information is in the accounts and mark and the team have not flagged any issues with us. So hopefully that should be a relatively straightforward piece of audit work that will pick up again in 22-23 when, when the uh, accounting standard comes implemented. Um, the last two risks in the table there are just to reflect the statutory kind of financial duties, the financial targets. Um, again, in all of our NHS plans, you will see these as risks in the plan. As it's a statutory financial target, we've got to do a sufficient amount of work on there to, to provide assurance that you know that is where we're going to be and that's what the figures are. Um, again, we've reflected there the month 10 position because that was the latest information we had at the time. Um, happy to report in the accounts. Obviously, we've got the month 12 outturn and both financial duties have been met. So subject to our audit work confirming that uh, nothing else I'd like to pull out really, Chair. Uh, happy to take any questions. Dear Mike, uh, thank you. That's a, a really helpful uh, highlight of the issues and the matters in the plan. Um, we are being asked to uh, approve the uh, uh, audit plan for 2022. Um, are we happy to do that? Are there any questions or observations you'd want to flag first? I think you've highlighted all the issues, Mike, uh, very clearly and have answered any potential questions that colleague uh, may have. You'll see before you then the plan, which includes uh, uh, details around the fee, the audit team and the timetable. So uh, on that basis then, I think we are happy to approve the plan and uh, look forward to receiving update reports uh, at our next committee meeting. Uh, Mike and uh, Simon, uh, thank you very much for your uh, observations on, on, on the plan and uh, on uh, the update report. Um, it was remiss of me earlier, and I think it was made on George, who made reference. I should indeed have formally welcomed uh, 
our new uh, interim director of operations, Gareth Davis, who has indeed joined us uh, around the virtual table this morning. So uh, I just like to make up for my uh, past weakness and remiss. So uh, you're very welcome, Gareth, to joining this committee and to joining DHCW also. Um, uh, and we'll move on then to uh, agenda items 3.7. We're doing quite well on time. Um, I propose that we break uh, at 10.45 around that time. Uh, we seem to be making good progress, so uh, I don't think there's any problem uh, around that, if you bear with us. We'll move on to agenda item 3.7, which is the audit report themes review. Uh, I'll now invite uh, our board secretary, Chris Darling, to present this review. Um, which you may recall was produced as a response to uh, this committee's request uh, at uh, our October meeting. Uh, Chris. Thank you, Chair. And I think um, we might have skipped over, Chair, one item from internal audit around the KPIs. Um, so if, if Simon's happy to do, I can do this, Simon, and then if you're happy to cover that item. Uh, if okay. the Chair's happy, I'm very happy to, Chris. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. No problem. So the um, in terms of the audit themes report, yeah, as you quite rightly said, um, Marion, it was a, a request that Ruth um, put to us at the October um, Audit and Assurance Committee to um, start to try and identify themes from audits that have taken place over the course of uh, the year. So we put this in um, as an item at this meeting. Obviously, we haven't had all internal audit reports at the time of writing this report. So the, the reports that have come to this committee weren't subject to the, the themed analysis. Um, and moving forward, what I'd like to try and do is um, work with uh, Julie Ash to, to ensure the tracker starts to uh, identify themes so that when they're closed, we keep the themes and we have a separate tab of themes um, so it can be an ongoing bit of work. So the, 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 the work was very useful in terms of a pause and reflection of the audits that have taken place over the last uh, nine months or so. What I found, though, is difficult to get out specific themes, mainly because of the breadth of the audits that have, that have taken place over the last nine months. So they obviously some fall into quite technical um, categories in terms of the more digital based audits and others are more corporate governance. Um, workforce um, audits, etc. So what I've done is just pulled out a number of areas um, that I think are probably significant um, from the audit. So um, just go through that list quickly. And then in the appendix is the full list of the audits and the full list of the recommendations which we used to help do the analysis. So um, ensuring a focus on systems and services being secure, uh, business continuity and disaster recovery plans uh, are in place and regularly tested was one thing that came up a couple of times. Um, in terms of um, working with suppliers, uh, contract metrics being in place with third party suppliers. The role of the NDR in one of the early data uh, audits being clearly defined was identified and I think that's been a theme, not necessarily through audits, but generally through discussions over the past nine months or so. Um, the resourcing of development teams came up, I and mean, that was specifically uh, to the WRIS audit, um, but I think it's relevant um, to us in terms of a the theme um, and the workforce challenges that we have. Uh, the ongoing focus on risk management and, and board assurance came through, as did uh, our focus on um, our strategic direction, um, our st stakeholder engagement, and working to become um, a trusted strategic partner across the system. Um, so it probably doesn't um, quite uh, answer the exam question set in its truest sense, but that's um, they were some of the areas that I think were important that have come up not just through audit, but also through discussions as well that that form themes. Um, so I'll pause there, Marion, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, Chris, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm sure Ruth would like to respond um, uh, as it was her uh, specific suggestion that led to this um, themes review. Uh, Ruth. 
Lovely. Uh, deal with Marion and deal. Thank you, Chris, for, for that. I think see, it's a useful piece of work and it'll become more useful as we get more audits on the list. Right. Um, it, it, and uh, what's what's key for me is that we then as independent members and as um, you know, directors and heads of round the table use that, as you say, some of these themes are coming up, not just in the audit forum. So we need to think about how we use that information if it's giving us a trigger to say, or oh, we've had a lot on a particular issue, and we know that we're talking about that, that actually we might need to do a bit more focused piece of work. And as we talk, think about our assurance role and deep dives, um, I think this is probably helpful. Um, this is probably helpful for that. So uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you. I, uh, I appreciate it's not easy because the, the audits are so different often, but um, there are, you can see clear threads coming through that and it comes through our discussions as well. Um, and uh, when we when we move into when we move into structured assessment, um, I'm sure our audit colleagues will be delighted that we've already done this piece of work for them. So uh, thanks for that, Chris. Dear Ruth, um, I've got David Salloway and then Claire Osmond Gitchell. David first. Uh, thanks, Marin. Uh, Chris, thanks for the uh, update. Good piece of work. I just wanted to ask a little bit around one of the themes, which was the uh, clarity of the role of DACW. There's a specific action in the action log around uh, the development of analytics and the role of the NDR and the role of our information directorate, which is a specific instance of clarity required. Is the theme as you've captured it um, just that or is it broader based on um, there was some work done on the, um, the digital strategy that we did with Gartner, which I think has helped but I'm just seeking uh, your view on whether there's still more to be done in that area. Yeah, so my view, David, and this is probably a personal view coming in relatively new to the organisation as well, is it's around how we describe the NDR so there's clarity to our stakeholders and partners what we mean so that when we talk about the NDR, we're talking about something that's consistently understood across the system so that, you know, when we mention it, someone else mentioned it and is thinking of something else. That's that's the angle I'm coming at from that team. Yeah, OK, thanks for the clarification. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Claire? So I reflected on this one. It's a, it's a really difficult exercise to do to effectively pull out um, uh, real nuggets of, of, of benefit, and I actually think it does. So my, my reflections were, um, actually, if you look at and read all the audit reports, if there is anything, a lot of the missing or the success factors linked to people and people behaviours, and I wondered whether when you use the themes, uh, I mean, we've talked today about collaboration. We've talked about working cross boundaries, working uh, collectively um, and developing together. And and I, I just thought, um, well, two things really. One is we've got an internal learning and development group. And I wondered whether sharing this with them to really think about what are the themes that we can influence as an, as an organisation and link it to our people and development that actually will knit together some of the successes and, and, and take us forward. Because I think if you look at trying to collect themes like test plans or DR plans, they're so specific. Um, I'm not sure how we would knit them together to really create learnings and, and value. So, um, so I suppose for me, I think it's a re I think Ruth is right. This is something that's going to develop and nurture as we develop as an organisation identifying the key themes so we can make that link will be really important and I'm not sure whether they are the themes that you've identified Chris although they are important but whether we should look at them from a people and competencies and values perspective and really try to draw on those examples because they will actually if you get that right and, and you develop those skills will actually um, ensure that our audits will be more effective in, in the future um, so I thought it was a really good good piece of work but I wondered whether we could actually take this away and maybe through the learning and development group Michelle maybe not but it's, it's really thinking about what are those key themes what are the what are the what is the culture of the organization and those qualities that we want to develop um, that will nurture those sort of behaviors but also the 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 frameworks that we will then be able to use uh, to be more effective 
Dear Claire, I think that's a really helpful suggestion, actually, in terms of uh, a potential action to share this with a learning development group internally. Um, I'll leave you to ponder over that, but it's something that is well worth considering, I think, going forward. So, Chris, as you can see, it's really um, your, your review has been very warmly welcomed. I think it's a very helpful first step uh, in a journey of identifying more detail around the qualities that actually uh, help deliver excellence and transformation within DHCW. So thank you for that. And um, we note the themes review, which has not been an easy task. So I think you've done incredibly well to have identified it to the degree that you have. And no doubt it will uh, be a helpful base for the structured assessment going forward as well. We'll go back now then to the internal audit KPI overview, which we missed out earlier, which was agenda item 3.4. So, uh, Simon, your moment in the limelight once again, uh, if I may, with apologies for uh, missing out earlier. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, no problem at all. And 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 just to reflect, if I may, for for, for a moment on uh, on Chris's paper, um, uh, I mentioned in our KPI paper that that we've just appointed a business support manager, who's um, part of their role is going to be looking at what are some of the common themes and threads from internal audits work across the board. So linking in with Chris on that in terms of some of the themes that are being identified, are they replicated elsewhere? Obviously not if they're DHCW specific, but perhaps more widely. And 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 there will be digital uh, and IT uh, um, you know themes coming up from other organisations too. Um, Chair, my 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 paper at three point four is very brief. It it just sets out. Uh, first of all, the KPIs we currently use, recognising those are part of the service level agreement uh, that we have and is updated uh, annually with board secretaries, and 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 recognising that that they're useful in terms of of measuring that we're getting things uh, to you on time and that the relationship with ma with management is effective uh, and so on. But we are very keen going forward to to do more work around the impact. Uh, of our work and recommendations. If we make recommendations and you accept them, then you know you are going to put in the effort to implement those. What's actually been the outcome and the results of that? So, so we're very much looking at um, uh, three things there. One around perhaps linking in with the audit tracker, uh, thinking around the percentage of recommendations that have been implemented, and what's been the impact of those recommendations? Has it strengthened governance, reduced risk, improved control, and so on? Uh, and that focus as well on the limited no assurance reports or high priority findings as they come in. Um, NWSSP itself is doing quite a lot of work around its customer engagement and measuring of quality. So we'll we'll dovetail with that as well in terms of a one NWSSP uh, approach. And then, uh, Chair, you've received um, uh, a number of reports to this committee during the course of the year. Uh, where we have already identified common themes and issues and put together the results of work that we've done from that um, uh, IT baseline assessment through Welsh language measures to a number of estates compliance issues. So looking to do more of that work uh, to really, you know, if you like, share more of the good practice and common findings uh, across the board. Um, so Chair, that's that's all I wanted to say on that paper, um, but just to give you a flavour of some of the things we are looking to do, and I'll be very happy to bring back, you know, progress on that during the course of the uh, of, of of the year and beyond. Thank you, Simon. Um, that's a, a really helpful up update, actually, and we will certainly be looking forward to uh, receiving updates in due course. Uh, I, I can see that uh, Claire would like to come in. Claire. Yeah, I thought it was really. Great, Simon. I like the. I like the. You know, if you looked at your current KPIs, it's really a, trying to measure efficiency in yes. terms of the time it takes, and 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 what you're trying to really now look at is is effectiveness. Yes. And I think that that bringing that together will be really um, helpful, um, uh, and, but difficult to do, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I welcome it and and look forward to uh, making sure it looks good. Actually. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Yeah, Claire. Chris. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I welcome this. And I think the proposed um, metrics going forward, what do our clients think of us is really important. Because I guess for the record, the um, our first year, you know, we've established and it's been challenging and we've had good 
critical friend support, if you like, from internal audit throughout our first year, which has been really important for us to get an external perspective and, you know, sharing some good practice testing ideas similarly for Audit Wales. So I think that metric in particular is important. Thank you, Chris. So um, very much welcome the approach that you've taken in uh, the uh, KPI overview and uh, uh, we note uh, the uh, report and uh, look forward to seeing it progressing. Uh, we've talked about collaboration um, and uh, working together. We talked about values uh, and um, certainly this is an opportunity to bring together some of those themes and the learning from work that you will be doing both internally and externally to DHCW. So, um, Simon, thank you and your team. So we'll uh, resume the agenda with uh, item 3.8, if I may. And um, this is the uh, audit tracker, the action uh, um, which uh, Julie Ash, our Head of Corporate Services, uh, will uh, present and update to the committee. Julie. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. So this is our regular report that we receive that enables us to track um, the audit's recommendations received from both Audit Wales and our internal audit uh, colleagues from Shed Services. So, um, positive report, I'm pleased to say, again, uh, for this meeting. So, at the last meeting, we actually reviewed 23 actions and we were able to close 17 of them, which left us with a total of six open actions. We actually received three reports at the last meeting, which I've listed on the cover sheet, which was relating to the Welsh radiology system, GP system procurement and governance arrangements. And they contained a total of 10 um, additional actions, which brought the number on the log up to 16. So I'm very pleased to say that um, we've been able to report 13 of those 16 as green, so as completed. Uh, and three are on track to be completed um, by the target. Um, so again, a, a positive performance. I think we're getting a lot better at um, picking up the actions and, and recommendations as soon as they're made and also being uh, realistic about timescales as well. So included on the cover sheet, I have just listed in bullet point form those actions that have been closed. And you'll note that there, there are a couple of lines with um, three on them. Um, I've also listed three um, actions which are on schedule to be completed by the target date. So in summary, I'd say it's excellent progress with a total of 13 actions being closed um, and we'll continue to keep on top of them <laughs> moving forwards. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Dear Julie, uh, thank you um, and very pleasing to see such excellent progress being made uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, th three months since we last met. Uh, so uh, 13 of the 16 uh, actions there are, are, are in green uh, and the vast majority, uh, 13 actions closed. Uh, so thank you. Um, are there any questions, any comments uh, to Julie? No, we're very pleased with the progress that's been made, Julie. So. Um, we uh, note the status of the tracker and uh, look forward to seeing uh, the uh, very positive progress being extended over the coming months as well as uh, more recommendations uh, arise from uh, our uh, audits. Thank you, Chair. So we'll move on to uh, agenda item 3.5 then, which is the local counter fraud update report. And it's my pleasure now to welcome Gareth Lavington to the committee. Um, and Gareth's going to provide uh, an update on the counter fraud work since uh, our last meeting uh, for the uh, uh, quarter ending uh, March 31st. Uh, you're very welcome, Gareth. Chris Thank you. Morning. Thank you, Chair. And uh, good morning to everybody and pleased to meet you all. Um, this is going to be a brief report. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the report that Nigel has kindly provided with regards to the period from the 1st of January to the 31st of March. There isn't a great deal to update upon it. Um, ultimately, I'm pleased to say that there have been no investigations incepted during that period, which uh, I think is a positive. Um, there have been fraud awareness presentations taking place. I'm 
I've I've been unable to chase Nigel on whether those took place between the 1st of January and the 31st of March, but I'm aware that only two were undertaken last year for 32 staff members. Um, and I, I am aware that, as Nigel has reported here, that the um, there are attempts ongoing in order to carry out um, presentations with regards to locally identified risk, if you like, with regards to mandate fraud. Um, and I think key coming from what's been spoken about earlier in this meeting, things to do with pre-employment checks, which is something that we would sort of get involved in as a counter fraud team moving forward. One thing of note, um, or two things of note actually, one is that I'm pleased to say that the team is now up to full strength. So moving forward for the forthcoming year, we have myself as the counter fraud manager, we have Henry who's just started as a new investigator with us. So there is myself and three others. So we're up to speed um, and hopefully we will be able to um, commit to a full provision in the coming year. It is worth noting that um, having completed the draft annual report in recent weeks, that the provision for the year has only been 29 days of the 40 days um, that was planned for. That's down to um, understaffing essentially, and hopefully we'll um, bring up that shortfall in, in the coming year. The, um, the annual plan has been drafted and myself and Claire have spoken about that. And um, I'm hoping that, and so is the annual report, and I'm hoping that for the next meeting now we can um, put that forward onto the agenda and sort of explain the plan for the forthcoming year. And hopefully I'll be able to update you at the next meeting with regards to what we've done so far in the first quarter according to that plan. But besides that, I don't have much more to update you on, but I am happy obviously to um, take any questions that you may have. Dear Gareth, thank you and uh, pleasing to hear that you are now at uh, uh, full capacity going forward, which was one of our concerns uh, expressed at uh, recent meetings. Yeah. Um, so I can see a number of hands up. I'll turn to uh, Ruth Glazer first of all, followed by uh, Claire and then Mark Cox. Uh, thank you, Marion. Thank you, Gareth, for that for that update. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we understand that you've been hit in terms of resource over the over over the over the last year. Um, so my question would be: Now you're back up to full speed. Is there anything more that we can do, or that you need from us to get the education and presentation piece on the go? Um, or it, are you are you happy with the with the engagement that we've we've had so far? Or or do we need to similarly, you know, increase our engagement now that you're back up to full strength? It is it is very much. Um, a point of engagement really Ruth to be honest I'm I'm putting together a full infrastructure of what I would expect from my team to deliver to DHCW with regards to um, awareness sessions presentations which are bespoke to the organization that you know because obviously we we provide this service to a number of organizations and the presentations for example might not be the same for each um, and I'm also keen um, to gain a level of understanding from the organization as to what their sort of inherent risks are, because this organization is new to myself and it's it's, it's a new organization as far as I'm aware, only being um, in existence for the last year. So moving forward really, for me, certainly in the first quarter is all about engaging with key contacts from the organization to gain a greater understanding of where we go with those things and improving reporting routes from staff and um, yeah understanding the risks and, and taking the necessary action with that so obviously getting together with um, some of the internal audit guys that have re been reporting here today would be one of those things as an example if you like brilliant thank you and uh, you know i always want to see more time spent on education than on investigation right that's where we need to that's where we need to continue to be well, so uh, yeah absolutely and and it, it's 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 a, it's been a huge challenge obviously through covid because that has just dropped off the radar for most organizations i think and and that really is key for me is to get that up and running whether it be well and and to find the right route for it really you know whether it is sort of virtual lunch and learn sessions that people can dip in and out of or um, things along those lines really and that's that's where 
my contact with yourselves comes uh, is key, really. Yeah. Dear Gareth, so uh, engagement is keen. I can see that Claire is keen to engage with you <laughs> at a yeah. precise moment. So Claire. Yes, thank you. And Gareth and I have met and gone through the plan for the next year. And I think it's it's how do we how do we align our resources to support the delivery of that plan and that that incentive? But I think we're both keen to identify any risk, but equally really raise the profile of of um, of uh, counter fraud um, through our counter fraud champion as well. So it's really about introducing our, our uh, champions within uh, DHCW and then working through that plan, um, which um, which we will. Dear Claire. Mark, have you anything to add? Uh, yes, um, good to meet you, Gareth. Um, hey, Mark. Yes, and, and it's heartening to hear you, you're up to speed in terms of resources and, um, you know, I look forward to um, dealing with you going forward. I think in terms of mandate fraud, we had a an extraordinarily large list, I think, when we discussed with Nigel around um, putting that particular session on and we were going to do it over two or three sessions. Yeah. Um, I, I think reflecting on that, um, there are a cohort of staff, I'd say, definitely need to be um, to be engaged with and a, a second cohort of staff which awareness would be suitable for so in terms of your plan going forward I you know I'd love to engage with you in terms of your yeah. thoughts on that yeah absolutely I, I was aware that Nigel had been in touch with you Mark and um, I, I'm coming to you this week with um, a list of my demands if you like but uh, <laughs> So hopefully moving forward, yeah, we we can work together with regards to how best to get that out there because obviously a mandate fraud can sort of eclipse um, 25 other frauds in, in one fell swoop. Exactly. So it's quite an important issue, yeah. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. And, and finally, Ruth? Um... It, was just, it was just a quick question. I hesitate to ask it because frequently when I ask these questions, the answer is, oh, well, it's you, Ruth. But who is our counter-fraud champion? That's a good question. <laughs> So, so from from a internal DHCW perspective, Rachel Powell was our uh, counter fraud champion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarity of, uh, uh, of that. So um, really helpful discussion. And uh, Gareth, I think you can see from the observations and contributions around the table that DHCW is very keen to uh, build on the engagement that's happened to date. And um, clearly there have been uh, ongoing discussions about the nature of the plan for the future. And we look forward as a committee to receiving uh, that uh, more detailed plan uh, at our next formal committee meeting in July. Uh, yeah. We wish you well with uh, the work in your new role as well. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, that, I think, brings us conveniently to the end of our well, the first part of uh, this morning's committee, it's just gone 10.45. Um, I suggest, therefore, that we take a full 15 minute break and come back to the table at five past 11, if that's all right. Dear thank you for your observations and contributions, and we'll see you uh, in just over 15 minutes time at five past 11. Dear Good, according to my watch, it is uh, five past 11. So I suggest that uh, we reconvene our meeting. I think we're all back. And um, part four of our, our agenda this morning deals uh, uh, with uh, governance activities and uh, the reports uh, for the next uh, items will be presented by colleagues from Digital Health and Care Wales. Um, so uh, the uh, next agenda item is in fact 4.1, uh, which is the annual accounts update. And I'd like to uh, invite uh, our Director of Finance, uh, Claire Osmondson little to present the update on the annual accounts. Uh, Claire. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I'm going to hand the floor to Mark Cox, who's going to take us uh, through the current position and of where we are and our timescale going forward. Uh, Mark. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Marion. Um, must be said that a lot of the update has been um, previously addressed by Mike, and uh, I guess just in, in addition to that is just to reflect on some of the activities that have taken place um, since this report was published and uh, also the um, the actions that need to take place over the next few weeks. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring attention to um, page two of the report, and particularly um, section 1.5 
Uh, 1.5 indicates the external reporting deadlines for the organization. Uh, the first um, uh, deadline refle reflected the day five financial performance submission, which was submitted to Welsh Government. And item two were the full monthly monitor returns, which is the performance reports um, identifying um, the organization, DHGW, had met its statutory reporting requirements in terms of um, break even position in revenue and break even position in capital. So that's a fantastic set of. Um, currently unaudited um, results for the organisation. We've also, as Mike uh, mentioned, submitted the draft accounts, which were uh, submitted on time at 12 o'clock on Friday. So there's been a major amount of activity since this report was produced. On the topic of transparency, um, we do liaise with um, Audit Wales on a on a weekly basis, and I've also incorporated as part of this report um, identification of some of the key matters arising as part of our discussions, namely uh, provisions, um, and and it's particularly in terms of um, calculation and disclosure as part of the accounts, in terms of the employee um, benefits and holiday pay accruals. And I'd like to bring to your attention as part of those um, items, um, two elements um, which need disclosure within the um, accounts, uh, the bad debt provision and the losses and special payments, which uh, require uh, particular attention in terms of uh, the notes and the narrative that accompanies the accounts. Um, you will uh, in due course see a, a, a section of the, the notes and um, be able to review those. Um, Mike also mentioned the IFRS 16 disclosure, and that again is part of our general discussions with uh, with Audit Wales. So, in effect, this report is just to update uh, the committee on the progress and to assure the committee that uh, uh, the delivery of the accounts is very much in hand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mark. Uh, thank you. And as Mark said. Um... Uh, we have uh, discussed aspects of this agenda item previously this morning, but are there any questions, any observations, any of my colleagues would like to make at this point? No, I think you probably answered all their questions, uh, uh, Mark, in your uh, brief presentation. So if there aren't any further observations then, um, I assume that we are happy to note the annual accounts update and thank you for your update Mark and your work on the annual accounts again. So we'll move on to um, the uh, next agenda item which is risk management uh, which of course includes the corporate risk register and I'll invite our board secretary Chris Darling now to uh, present an overview of our corporate risk position um, and to update uh, us on the work to develop our board assurance uh, framework approach. Chris. Dioc Chair, and I'll, I'll bring in colleagues as I go through the, the uh, report um, at appropriate time. So just to start off with our current corporate risk uh, position, we've got 21 risks on the register. Ten of them are detailed. Um, in the risk log included in the papers. There's 11 security related um, risks that are considered at digital, each digital governance and safety committee in private session. And I'll come back to that um, later on um, in the report. Um, so I'm asking committee members to note some of the changes to the corporate risk register in our position. So as mentioned, a number of risks have been added onto the risk register over the last couple of months. Um, these generally relate to um, cyber um, risks, um, but there's also been a number of risks that have been removed from the risk register, and these are listed out um, within the report. Uh, their region for closure or being downgraded to being re reviewed at directorate level. Um, the heat map in section 2.4 shows a visual uh, of the risk profile position, and in line with our um, committee assignment approach. There's three risks currently assigned um, to this um, committee of the board for oversight and scrutiny. So I'm just going to work through those quickly before I um, come back to the cyber uh, risks. So the staff vacancies committee members will recall the last meeting. There was a deep dive um, that our head of workforce and OD and Michelle gave 
into uh, this risk. So I'll just see if Michelle wants to add anything now in terms of work since that committee meeting. Thank you, Chris, and apologies, we've got a visitor, so my dog has decided to be very noisy, so apologies if you can hear that in the background. Um, perfect timing. So, uh, yes, I mean, we have, we are keeping this risk under regular review. As Chris said, we had done a bit of an update. We've been doing a reflections on the last 12 months from our recruitment task force, um, and there have been some very um, aspects of that that have been very effective, I think, and we've seen quite a significant uh, number of new people joining the organisation, which is good. I think what we have done, and we discussed it also at the management board, um, uh, toward the end of last month was look at, okay, what are the steps we need to take going forward now? Um, and how do we want to reposition the work of that group perhaps to focus on other areas? Uh, so as part of that, um, uh, Julie actually in commercial service and her team have developed a commercial resourcing strategy that we'll be working through with the team now. And we're looking, as I say, at particular areas of focus for the recruitment group. I suspect what will happen is that we will disband that task force and probably stand up a slightly different group, um, more of a, a sort of finance uh, workforce commercial a joint uh, working group so that we can look at all aspects of resourcing and capacity um, as well as just recruitment. So that's certainly in the plan uh, as we move forward now into this year. Um, and obviously we've got some really good work that workforce business partners have been leading in terms of the workforce plans and the capacity requirements. Uh, so I think it's just about the most appropriate way to address those now as we move forward. Thank you, thanks. Michelle. Chris? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. The um... The next risk that's assigned to this committee is the Welsh language compliance. So this risk remains unchanged. Um, our Welsh language uh, services manager came into post um, earlier this year and has done a lot of work, one of which has been to review the standards um, and our compliance against them. And the next agenda item, I'll come on to talk through some of that, but the assessment um, from Aleri has been to keep that as unchanged. There are a number of standards we're not complying with, which will We'll go through in the next agenda item and there's also a significant number that we are and we're work we've got an action plan to work against each of those um the final risk assigned to this committee is the welsh language two-way text vaccination appointment um this was due to be completed about now uh, as i understand it um it's been agreed uh, with welsh government that that will um go live in terms of the mitigation um to ensure bilingual two-way text um, appointments in June. Um, Welsh Government set the priorities for the immunisation programme, so that's been um, slightly shifted from what we last um, uh, mentioned in terms of having an early May mitigation date, so that the current position is June, as I understand it, for that risk. Um, as, pr as previously mentioned, the um, the Digital Governance and Safety Committee uh, review the cyber risks, which is where the majority of the activity actually over the last two or three months have taken place, clearly in the context of a heightened cyber threat. But and there's been a lot of work that's been carried out. Um, so I'd invite Carwin to initially um, just give an overview of some of the work that's been undertaken over the last few months. And then um, if David Selway, as uh, a member of the DGNS Committee, wants to comment on the scrutiny and assurance that that committee is receiving in terms of the work to review those risks. Um, welcome him to do that. So, Carwin. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so I was going to I was going to explain um, a little bit about the risks. Um, so, so we used to have one um, risk on the register relating to uh, ransomware and the the risk of of ransomware. And, and what we've done is. Uh, so several of the new risks that have been logged, so those numbers 77 to 82, are where we've taken that generic risk and split it into uh, more specific risks. And this is following a bit of work that we had done uh, with a consulting uh, firm, a company called Net Consulting, came in and did uh, some work for us. They undertook, undertook a specific ransomware assessment for us. And so we've we've split them into um, more specific ones. So as an example, one relates to having longer recovery times. Another one refers to kind of sort of permanent loss of data. One refers to identity management, uh, those kinds of things. So that allows us to potentially then um, put more specific um, uh, projects or, or um, activities in place that will allow us to, to target the um, likelihood or the impact 
um, of one of those materialising, because otherwise we would have a risk that wouldn't really have changed for, for a very long period of time. So that's that's what's happened. So one of those risks, which was the uh, 0261, that was the original one. We have now since um, closed that because it was the, it was the um, random one. So, um, yeah. Um, and then uh, just a couple of other things just to say as well. Um, I think 0257, I'm reasonably confident we'll be able to close that soon. So we're just monitoring. We've made some changes and we're just monitoring that. So hopefully we'll be in a position to, um, to close that. And then the last one, 0283, I just wanted to mention, was a was a commercial issue with one of our suppliers that could have affected service availability. Um, and we've we've dealt with that and that's now being closed. That was a GP system supplier that had a, a problem with one of their um, data center operators. Um, and so we quickly logged a risk, uh, but they've now um, sorted. Uh, one of the co company called SunGuard went into administration um, last month and um, uh, so Sejidim, the, the, the GP system supplier, has now put a contract in place with the uh, owner and operator of the data centre, a company called Global Switch. So we've managed to close that risk. OK. Thank you. Um, Thank the cyber risks are uh, considered by our digital um, governance committee. And I don't know whether David, as Chris suggested, would like to uh, uh, make any observations at this point, David Selway? Uh, just a comment. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Carwin, for the update. Um, uh, yeah, just um, initially we were a little bit concerned when we saw a large number of new risks being added, but Carwin's given a very good explanation of why we've done that. And frankly, uh, once we understood uh, that we were breaking a, a bigger risk down into smaller manageable things. We were all reassured that this was definitely the right thing to be doing. So we we are keeping a careful eye on it, but I'm happy to say that we are making good progress in the right direction. Thank you, David. And we have seen from the action log uh, earlier this morning that we discussed with the Digital um, uh, Governance Committee, uh, well, keen to avoid any duplication considerations. So those cyber risks have now been formally assigned, as Chris outlined, to uh, that committee. But it's our duty as an uh, audit committee to ensure that those processes and systems are appropriately in, in, in place. So Chris, back to you. Thank you, Chair. So the remaining part of the report I just wanted to draw to committee members' attention was that we have, um, in terms of the milestone plan, delivered training to DHCW staff on risk and board assurance over the past uh, two months. Um, and there is um, a board assurance framework session planned for the board development day um, this week on Thursday uh, for further discussion to progress the board assurance fra framework uh, with the aim to take that to the board at the end of May. And that was that was the areas I wanted to pick up, Chair. Dear Chris, thank you for uh, that uh, brief presentation. Uh, are there any questions or observations? David. Observation, uh, if, if I may, uh, Chair. Um, Michelle, thanks for the update on the uh, the task force and would uh, fully support what we're proposing to do in terms of uh, shifting the focus. You, you may have covered this, but I'll, I'll just seek some clarification. So one of the things um, we may consider doing um, is to put more focus on an internal staff development program and, and try to grow, train people into the skills that we need if we're struggling to recruit. So it may have been covered in what you said, but if it's not, it, could I suggest that we maybe take it into consideration? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I didn't mention that. No, you're absolutely right to pick that up. And that's really important. And we've seen some success in specific areas of the organisation in our application development area, particularly where they've brought people in, um, you know, either sort of school leaver or we've also got our, our apprentice uh, programme. And it is something that we've discussed and something we want to look at how we scale that across the organisation. And obviously, I think one of the important points as we move in that uh, direction is ensuring that we've got the right measures in place to support the people that we bring in. So you're absolutely right that we've got that clearly sort of developed programme of development and we so people can see how they can move through the organisation, the sort of 
a development that they need to undertake in order to do that and that we've got the right management support as well so we're looking at, at both of those aspects in terms mm. of how we can take that forward yeah great thank, thanks michelle I, and i think um um because i was saying that will probably help with retention as well if we're seen to be a yeah. an organization that's keen to uh, support the development of our staff uh, staff are more likely to stay with us rather than be uh, attracted elsewhere yeah agreed Dear David, and thank you for making that uh, in really important point in, in fact. So we note as a committee then the risk position, uh, the risks assigned to this committee for scrutiny, and we'll come back in a moment to the Welsh language compliance. Um, and we note also the board assurance milestone plan and uh, the progress to date. And thank you, Chris, uh, for your work in this area. So let's turn then to agenda item 4.3 on the Welsh language compliance, which is one of the risks assigned to this committee. Uh, and as uh, Chris outlined, uh, we note the appointment, uh, the recent appointment of um, uh, Welsh language services manager. So, uh, Chris, I'll hand over to you once again to uh, present the Welsh language compliance report which uh, updates us on uh, our current compliance on the Welsh language uh, standards. Deal. Yeah, thanks, Marion. And I'm just going to start by giving a bit of context and background because I think this will be a, a standing item of, as we move forward. One that Aleri uh, will will come to the committee to present. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make today's meeting. Um, but so just, just starting with some background. So special health authorities are not currently named under the 2011 Welsh language measures. Um, however, um, as an organisation, we've continued to maintain compliance uh, and monitor against the standards. This took place previously in the predecessor organisation, MWIS, um, who were hosted by Valindra. So we were adhering to the Welsh language standards as they were issued to Valindra. Um, clearly, now as a statutory body in our own right, we are um, committed to being bilingual. And uh, when we... Um, established um, one of the first things we did was start to develop uh, a Welsh language scheme. Um, a, a more context, I guess, is as as we established, we had to put in um, an estimation of um, Welsh language resource requirements as an organisation. It's probably fair to say um, that was an estimation. We've clearly um, grown during the first year and, and developed a much better understanding of what those requirements are, both from a staffing perspective um, with Aleri now in post, but also importantly from a translation services perspective. Um, so during 2021-22, um, we had an SLA with shared services, uh, their Welsh language translation service. We more than double, um, sorry, we used more than double uh, that that we had down as part of the SLA. Uh, and, and I'm grateful to Claire and Mark for the flexibility uh, in terms of us understanding during this first year what our requirements have been and putting in place uh, plans for 22-23 that, that will allow us to use what we've used during our first year and hopefully grow into more um, translation because I think it's fair to say as the year progresses and, and looking ahead to next financial year I think we will use more translation service. Um, in terms of benchmarking we're currently a fair way behind um, HEIW and Public Health Wales in terms of comparator or national organisations. Um, so it's an area that we're keeping a close eye on in terms of establishing as an organisation, have we got things right? So just, just to talk through the, um, the compliance report to start with, as I mentioned, um, Aleri has reviewed the, um, the standards action plan as we had in place. Um, made a few uh, amendments, but generally, um, as set out uh, in table item 4.3i, all the standards there and our compliance against them. So there's some initial completion dates um, that, are, that are included, but there is further work required to, rem to plan out the remaining activity to ensure we're fully compliant. Um, there's a number of standards that aren't applicable to us uh, generally very much patient facing standards. There are 55 um, standards where we've got uh, an action uh, RAG status as green, so the action's complete and we're operationally compliant. 
Um, there's 25 where we're amber, so actions are underway, and 37 where we're red. Um, so we, we've identified the action required, but the deployment's not started yet. And that's out of a total of 127 standards. In terms of the um, Welsh language uh, scheme, so as mentioned, um, one of the first things we, we did was draft a, um, a scheme specifically relating to DHCW as an organisation. Um, we've been liaising over the last 12 months with the Welsh Language Commissioner's Office to develop that scheme. A final draft now has been translated and submitted back to the Commissioner's Office for approval. Um, I'm not aware before going on leave it hadn't been approved. I'm not aware that it has been since coming back. Um, that was the third iteration that we'd shared with them. However, we have um, uh, undertaken a number of activities to prepare for the approval of that scheme, in, including preparing our uh, communication and engagement around the scheme, um, agreeing um, contact lists so we can proactively write out and ensure we get feedback on the scheme. The scheme will be subject to a, a 12 week formal period of public consultation. Um, in terms of organisational uh, Welsh language skills, I uh, should draw to the attention of the committee that there, there was a bug in the e electronic staff record um, that caused an issue when we transitioned to DHCW. So we are doing a fair bit of work um, to do some data cleansing um, to ensure that we're clear on the skills levels of staff within DHCW. There's a significant number of staff who are marked as zero skills. Uh, for Welsh language um, and we, we want we want to need to validate that uh, and we're hoping that a number of those um, will increase uh, as that validation exercise takes place. So the activity for that we're hoping to complete that um, by the end of June 2022 so we have a clear benchmark position of the organisation's uh, Welsh language skills assessment. Um, I just wanted to pick out um, some areas that um, the Welsh Language Services Manager Larry has been involved in since starting a couple of months ago with the with the organisation. So Larry attended and presented a 10 minute 10 talk or a, a 10 minute uh, presentation to the DHCW staff conference. That was really really well um, uh, engaged. There were there were over 530 DHCW staff that listened into that which suggests you know, a really good appetite for more information and support on the Welsh language within the organisation. So that's that's really positive from our perspective. Marion, you mentioned earlier your, your role um, within the national work, looking at the more than just words um, uh, task and finish group. Aleri is a member of that, of that group, uh, subgroup, and a number of um, and working with colleagues uh, to drive forward a number of actions there. Um, in terms of um, Welsh learners within DHCW, so staff, we've really been encouraging um, to try and create a culture of, of um, Welsh language within the organisation. We're encouraging staff to write blogs about their learning experiences and we're doing a learner of the month, um, which is published on our SharePoint site so that um, we can try and get a, a bit of community of practice around Welsh language. Um, a couple of other priority areas, uh, recruitment being one, ensuring that all future uh, DHCW job advertisements are done bilingually. Um, we have a number of uh, performance indicators that have been agreed with workforce colleagues um, around increasing the number of Welsh essential posts, ensuring that all jobs are advertised bilingually and that all newly um, matched job descriptions are trans translated. Um, in terms of this report, we will bring a standing item to this committee so that we can review the compliance, particularly against the standards. But I think we want to go a bit further than just seeing it as a compliance related issue for us. We are a national organisation, I think one that have real ambitions to be a, a leader in terms of a bilingual um, organisation. So we'd like to, to showcase some of the work that we're doing to promote the Welsh language um, yeah. moving forward. Um, so we're starting to gain a better understanding of the uh, requirements, as I mentioned at the start, um, but there is a difference between requirements and our uh, desire and ambition to be a leading organisation in terms of NHS Wales. So we've, we've established the scheme 
Um, but I think uh, we will we will be looking for a board level discussion around our ambition um, within the Welsh language moving forward. And in terms of work over the last uh, four, three or four months or so, I just want to thank Kaleri for all the work she's done. Uh, she's really hit the ground running um, in this area. And before I conclude, man, I just uh, want to ask if if Carwin wants to add anything. He's been vital and chaired the Welsh language group way before my time with DHCW. So. Um, I've got nothing specific to add, uh, Chris. It's just that we were previously working under the Belindra um, um, standards and you know uh, under the under the Welsh language measure. Um, so I think a lot of the things we've got. Um, controls in place already who it is now uh, but obviously now that we've got a Larry in place we've got a lot more focus on it and I think she's picking up on some of the things that we thought that we had sufficient controls being in place that she doesn't feel that they are so um uh, yeah so I think it's good and it's it's good that we're making progress and identifying places that we need to improve dear Carwin um uh, and I've been assigned the task of being board champion for the Welsh language in terms of the IM cohort um, and delighted to take that responsibility. Um, it's really pleasing actually to see the positive change that uh, Ellery has instigated within the organisation in just a very short period. Um, and um, I do sense there's been quite a positive sea change in the cultural tone and our approach to the Welsh language, which can only um, develop positively as the weeks and months go by. So um, really look forward to uh, uh, receiving the first formal report um, by, by Ileri um, and to get a better understanding of uh, the progress we can and should be making in, in this area. Um, I Carwin ond uh, yn fwy a penodol i, I Eleri am uh, rhoi i'r uh, mesur y newydd yn ei lle. I was just putting on record formally our appreciation not only to Carwin and Chris, but more specifically to Eleri as Welsh Language Services Manager for the positive steps that have been put in train in what is clearly a very brief period in post. Um, so we look forward to getting those uh, uh, quarterly updates uh, at our next committee meetings. So we are being asked to receive the report for assurance, which uh, we do. But I just wanted to check whether there were any further questions or observations before I bring this discussion to a close. Yeah. So we move on to uh, agenda item 4.4, uh, the declarations of interest, gifts and hospitalities report. Uh, and I'll invite Chris back to uh, report on uh, on uh, this uh, agenda item. Diolch. Chair, and we're required uh, as a committee to review this at each of our um, committee meetings. So just a few areas to update. All board members' declarations of interest were received and captured on the register for 21-22, um, as previously shared with the committee. The, the final register, um, which is included as 4.41, um, saw a compliance rate of 87% for Band 8As and above uh, for last financial year, our first financial year um, operating as an organisation. Um, so that's that's good. We, you know, we hope to do better this year. Um, so 4.4 II now we're into 22-23 is the new register uh, as it as it was at the 10th of April when we took the cut, um, which again focuses uh, initially on band 8A and above. Um, but we hope to um, to see all staff or as many staff as possible complete their declarations of interest this financial year. Um, we've done a fair bit of work to promote the standards of behaviour policy, um, declarations of interest, gifts and hospitality um, across the organisation. This was discussed at the last committee meeting uh, and it is a standing item on the DHCW corporate induction now. So all new staff coming into the organisation are aware um, of their of the requirements. Uh, I'm asking the committee to note um, a number of things as well. So four declarations for gifts and hospitality. So. Um, in terms of hospitality, there's three noted. I'm aware 
uh, there might be one or two others that um, could and should be on that register. So we'll need to come uh, to the next audit committee retrospectively. Um, and I also want to just bring to the attention there's one gift included for a value of £56.49, which was initially accepted uh, and subsequently um, declined um, due to it being um, the, the, the value of the gift. Um, so that one, I'd like that reflected in the minutes, if that's OK. Um, so it's just for um, I'm just asking the committee to note um, the hospitality and gifts received or declined during the period since the last meeting. Dear Chris, um, Ruth. Uh, thanks, Chris, um, and thank you for thank you for doing this. I think it's clear to all of us that we aren't the right game if we're looking for expensive gifts or hospitality. So um, the the register is what I'd expect to see. Um, and I always raise the point around, you know, the important thing is people use it if we get if we do get anything. Um, and it feels like if we do get anything, it's so unusual that people declare it anyway. So we don't have a culture of taking stuff and and, uh, and and not declaring it because it's not usual for us in our in our sector probably in the in, in our staff to get those things so uh, thank you for thank you for bringing this along for us dear Ruth um, and I'll uh, second that uh, uh, appreciation um, there's clearly been a lot of work since uh, uh, we last received a report uh, at committee um, and um, clearly we've reached the declaration uh, rate of 87% for band 8A and above. I think as a committee, I think I can safely say we would hope to see that edging much more closely to the 100% mark over the coming year. Um, and um, we'll be uh, uh, looking forward with interest to see uh, that improvement. So the committee is being asked to note um, the work to populate the declarations of interest register and note um, with the specific amendment uh, highlighted by uh, the board secretary there, we note the declarations of guest hospitality sponsorship and honorary declarations uh, up to uh, the end of March 22. We're happy to do that. Thank you. So. Uh, We'll move on then to uh, agenda item 4.5, which is the high value purchase order and cumulative report. And I'll invite uh, uh, Mark Cox, the Deputy Director of Finance, uh, to prevent the high value purchase order report, which uh, we as a committee are being asked to uh, note. Mike. Thank you, Chair. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, this um, this report presents uh, the high value items um, ordered over the period and this period covers uh, January the 19th to the end of the financial year, the 31st of March. Uh, not only does it identify um, singular high value items, so orders um, over the 750k threshold, but it also identifies where cumulative supplier amounts have exceeded that amount. And that's fundamentally for transparency to the audit committee. So during that period, um, we've actually uh, transacted five orders over the 750k threshold, um, one being the GP systems maintenance support in terms of the HP um, managed print service. This service um, supplies um, support to 7,500 devices across 388 practices across NHS Wales. So it's a key service that's supplied across um, organisations and GP surgeries and that was completed during that period. There's also a supplementary item in terms of the GP systems maintenance contract and, and that's in terms of the support and maintenance agreements which was transacted again um, since January 19th. Other items into, include um, the KNOS software, um, software support and that indicates um, delivery of work packages um, in support of the digital services and, and patients and um, um, digital systems, patients and, um, uh, excuse me, let's just get this right, the DSPP programme, which is supported by the DPF programme. Um, in terms of the work packages, um, they delivered uh, the um, 
discovery phases and inhabiting both those work work packages and supplied um, the development resource in terms of uh, not only the um, proof of concept, but also uh, NHS digital um, for access of NHS apps that support as well. The last item is reflective of the Microsoft agreements with um, uh, the Microsoft developers to support the test, chase and protect program um, in terms of the COVID response. In terms of the um, cumulative supplier elements which have um, um, breached the 750k threshold, um, you'll see um, from table two, one of those items being the ongoing um, lease of vehicles for um, staff within the organisation. Um, these items are um, deducted from staff payroll, so there's no cost to the organisation. And uh, one thing I'd like to bring to your attention is in terms of the, the actual staff lease um, uh, cars uh, in terms of the, the, the final quarter of the year, there's been major shifts towards electric vehicles. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to pick up in terms of the shift from either hybrid um, cars or petrol based cars and what that's doing for our environment and how we're actually promoting that within the organisation. A supplementary item um, I'd like to bring to your attention is reference B14 and that's related to the PSPA um, uh, implementations at North Wales in terms of GP surgeries. Um, this is going to be the last item this financial year and uh, that will no longer progress into the next financial year. So with that, um, Chair, I'd like to submit the report to note and uh, happy to take questions. Dear Mark, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, that gives you the update uh, with regard to high value purchase orders over three quarters of a million pounds raised and issued over the uh, last period. Um, I've got uh, a couple of questions. Well, Ruth, to begin with, um, do you have a question? Uh, Jill Marion, so it's a comment rather than a question. I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm keen on the cumulative picture. I think what's interesting about the cumulative picture is how much that actually adds up to. Um, you know, there is there is a large amount of stuff in there that we wouldn't normally look at. As a, as, as a board because it falls under the 750,000 piece. But when you look at it adding up, there's several millions in there. It's, you know, it's almost equivalent to the you know, approaching the value of our single large, large orders. So it's just really helpful to see that there because I think it just allows us to have that additional transparency. So uh, thank you for bringing that forward, Mark. Dear Ruth, um, so very, very helpful in terms of transparency. Um, I don't know whether there's anything you, you would want to come back on that in terms of is there anything that we should be reviewing in our processes to try and avoid that sort of cumulative figure um, coming before us? I, I think an interesting exercise at the end of the year would be to review that and to, 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 to evaluate whether we could go out to procurement for you know with, with that in mind or you know if there's any particular trends there's there's possible the likelihood of economic gains in terms of um, going out to procurement for that amount in the first place um just just to just to note i did trip over my words dspp is digital services for patients and the public just for, for the meetings thank you um i can see that uh, thank you mark and thank you for that clarity um I can see that Michelle, our Chief Operating Officer, um, wants to come in on that last point, presumably, Michelle. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, I think it is a helpful exercise and I think we can certainly, we do periodic reviews in terms of where our procurement activity is and whether we should contract differently. I'd have to say, looking at the list, the majority of those were reported to the board. They're actually call-offs of significant level agreements, so hopefully colleagues uh, we'll recognise some of those. Uh, Kinos, for example, uh, GP, etc., would have been through the board process because of the the sheer uh, volume of them. But they're in effect frameworks, aren't they? And we're we're recognising here the call offs against those frameworks. But I'm you know happy to take that, and I'm sure Julie uh, will continue to do that with the procurement team as well to look at patterns and trends uh, and identify any uh, different contracting opportunities. Really, yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, Michelle, and uh, I think uh, that certainly would be worth uh, looking at. So we leave that with you to take forward uh, as a, a potential action for consideration then. So um, we uh, um, we uh, are being asked to note the details of those procurements reported since the last audit committee, which we have done. Which brings us nicely then to agenda item 4.6 and uh, the losses and special payments update. And again, uh, I'll hand over to Mark Cox, if I may. Mark. Thank you, Chair. And uh, this is the first um, instance of, uh, of us bringing uh, a report to you um, regarding losses and special payments. And we'd like to present uh, two items um, totaling uh, 1.173 million. Uh, these items have been duly recorded and reported via the LastPass system and reflect um, legal advice and the appropriate governance and decisions in order to make these payments. Um, in terms of item 5C, um, the other compensation payments made under legal obligation, this was made in uh, under the direction of Welsh Government and was duly supported by the appropriate funding. Um, so in terms of our end of year position, there's nil impact on our performance for the financial year. Um, they are very high level in terms of the, the presentation, um, but I'm happy to take questions uh, or respond in the private section. Dear Mark, uh, are there any questions uh, at all on any aspect of uh, this particular agenda item on the losses and special payments update? Ruth. Uh, Dil, um, thank you for the thank you for the update. I think I'd just say it's helpful to have this come forward to to audit board so that we can gain assurance as a as a committee that uh, you know the processes are correctly in place for payments of this sort to be made. And you would expect, I think, you know, perhaps we've made this comment before, you would expect in the commercial world to see these types of payments as a course in the course of doing business. Um, so, you know, thank you to the team for bringing that bringing that forward to us. I don't think there's anything here that we wouldn't expect to see in the in the course of us doing our business. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, Ruth, um, and uh, I, I certainly second that uh, these are the kind of payments which are routinely uh, occurring in other organisations, but uh, it's important that they're brought to the audit committee for complete transparency. So thank you, Mark, for bringing that update report to the committee. Um, so we note the details of losses and special payments for um, the, the last uh, financial year. We've, uh, we've talked about procurement um, previously this morning and uh, we now come to our procurement and scheme of delegation compliance report, uh, agenda item 4.7. And uh, I will now hand over to uh, our head of commercial services, Judy Francis, who will provide uh, the update uh, with regard to procurement activity uh, undertaken during the last quarter of the last financial year. Judy. Thanks very much, Chair. So the committee is required to note today um, the single tender and single quotation activity and change notes during the period. There have been three STAs and six change notes to the value of 2.735 million. Ruth, you'll be very pleased to know, picking up on your earlier point, that this is a reduction in the number of STAs since the last report in January. It was five that um, in the January report. Um, all submissions are first ones, which is positive to note. And the STAs and change notes all cover a range of activity to keep the operational services going and for professional and workforce accreditation. Um, with regards to those STAs, they've all been executed in accordance with standing financial instructions, section 12 and the public contracts regulation 32. Um, that is the specific cases and circumstances laid down in the regulations where contracting authorities may award public contracts by a negotiated procedure without public without prior public publication. Can't speak, excuse me. And then in terms of the change notes, again, compliant, all change notes have been undertaken in accordance with the modification of contracts under PCR 2015 Regulation 72 and again with um, within the remits of 12.17 of the standing financial instructions. 
Um, that brings my my uh, report overview to its conclusion. Does anyone have any questions they would like to raise at this point? Thank you. Getting positive nods and thumbs up across the virtual table, um, Julie. So uh, very pleasing and welcoming uh, the uh, positive shift in performance that we've seen uh, uh, during the, the period under consideration then. Uh, so thank you for that update report. Uh, I don't think there are any uh, questions or observations. So uh, we note the content of um, the, uh, the, the the update report. Thank you very much. Thanks, we'll, move on. we'll move on then to agenda item 4.8, which is the quality mm -hmm. and regulatory compliance update report. Um, and uh, I'll invite Claire Osmonds and Little to uh, uh, introduce uh, this uh, agenda item, if I may, Claire. Thank you, Marion. Um, so this is the Quality and Regulatory and the Cyber Resilience Unit report. Um, it was uh, the quality performance um, was actually uh, ended the year on, on a high where we actually had the ISO 9000 and the ISO 14001 audits with no um, significant audit actions. Uh, so uh, we had no non-compliances, which was which was an excellence. And if you look at our performance over the year, which we will do in the next audit committee, you'll see the progress that's been made in terms of the compliance and completion of those audits. We actually, we also finalized our IMTP plan um, and we've brought it to life uh, to uh, really look at the implementation of that across the organization for the next 12 months including uh, the adoption of our iPassport, which is our quality management system, uh, and also our quality portal, which is our landing page, uh, which really helps to direct and focus um, the, the uh, quality actions and uh, quality papers that we've got. Uh, this was the first month that we've undertaken our quality management monthly report uh, for the quality and regulatory group. Uh, this was something that was developed by the team. Um, and we've also uh, continued our work on the medical devices compliance uh, work. In terms of the Cyber Resilience Unit, uh, I'm happy to report that their annual plan was presented to the directors of Digital Peer Group, uh, which um, validated uh, the approach and subsequently was signed off by Welsh Government and then circulated to chief execs. Um, and again, they've undertaken audits on behalf of Welsh Government during during the quarter and reported the outcomes of those to the relevant health boards and trusts. So the outlook for quarter one, um, it starts tomorrow, actually. We have the ISO 27001 re-audit uh, for security uh, uh, management. Um, so that will, that will start in haste uh, tomorrow. And we've also got the ISO 9001 and a surveillance audit for the ISO 14001 coming up. We've also, uh, as part of our plan, uh, initiated a risk-based internal audit programme. And again, the training and development of that is progressing well. Um, and also we'll be focusing on the evidence, the review of evidence for the legislation uh, register, which is part of the IMB group. So to summarise, it's been a strong performance from the quality team. Um, we've got, uh, we're really focusing on bed, embedding quality within the directorates through our new reports and our audit approach. Um, we have also, um, as you saw from the reduction in the risk register, uh, the document management system is starting to develop in pace and will be underpinned uh, by iPassport. And finally, I'd like to welcome uh, Paul Evans, who has kindly uh, agreed to step up uh, for the next six months to support the quality and assurance team um, following Conrad's uh, sad passing. And equally, I will oversee the cyber resilience unit until we have uh, alternative arrangements in place. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. Dear Claire, thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, highlight update and um, really pleasing to note that strong performance embedding quality in, in all uh, that we do. And um, I'm sure on behalf of the committee, I'd like to uh, wish uh, Paul Evans well in his new role. And no doubt we'll be seeing Paul at this committee uh, again at future meetings. So we wish you well. Um, I can't see any hands up, so I assume that 
uh, you have provided uh, sufficient detail and clarity, Claire, in your uh, presentation. So uh, we note the content of your update report and particularly welcome uh, the uh, positive performance that we've seen uh, during this last period. So we'll move on then to um, agenda item 4.9, which is the Baseline Governance Review Action Plan Report. Now, we've referred several times to the Baseline Governance Review, which will lead to uh, the more formal structured uh, assessment, which we've heard about from our auditors during the course of the morning. And uh, uh, you'll recall that uh, the baseline assessment was agreed as a foundation for the uh, more structured assessment that uh, we will be undertaking or, or will be undertaken on our behalf uh, in this uh, forthcoming financial year. So uh, it's my pleasure now to invite our board secretary to uh, present the baseline governance review action plan. Chris Darling. Thank you, Chair. And um, colleagues will note this is in uh, this section of the agenda, not the the audit section for that reason, reason it wasn't a formal structured assessment. Um, however, we did, we were provided with a number of opportunities for innovation and improvement. And as per the discussion at the last uh, audit and assurance committee, we, we did say we would track those through um, and they've been taken to our management board on a monthly basis since that report was published. And they come back here um, to, for the committee to note some of the progress. They're not formal recommendations, as I say, but they are um, areas for consideration in terms of innovation and improvement. And I'll just pick out um, some of the key areas of progress. The, the full um, action plan is uh, included as 4.9i, uh, along with all the updates for each of the areas um, of, or each of the opportunities, I should say. Um, so the first point um, in terms of partnership work in the IM digital network has been established formally now. Um, the first meeting took place at the end of January and the second meeting um, took place um, uh, at the end of April, so last week, I believe. Um, in terms of stakeholder engagement, the strategy has now been formally approved by the board uh, in January. There's a supporting communication strategy being developed, uh, which will go to the board in the next couple of months. Um, as uh, committee members here will be um, acutely aware we are now um, recording our committee meetings and publishing those recordings on the DHCW website to enhance uh, our openness and transparency in the way uh, we operate and do board business. Um, as part of that process we've delivered some virtual etiquette uh, training uh, leading up to that. Um, the Digital Governance and Safety Committee um, is taking place uh, this month also and that will be recorded and posted. Um, there is the IM vacancy uh, which uh, was picked up on in the baseline governance review that we're in the process now um, of appointing to that position. The SIFT uh, takes place tomorrow um, and interviews for that position um, all being well take place on the 7th of June. Um, and clearly from the baseline governance review pers perspective, the recommendation was around considering um, skills gaps um, in the board uh, makeup and diversity of the board. So that will be taken into account through that process. So I think we're, we're hopeful over the coming months that a number of these opportunities uh, we will close out and we'll bring back an update in ju uh, the July audit committee meeting. So you can see some of the progress we will continue to track this. Um, and then we will revert back clearly um, once a structured assessment's been made to tracking it through the formal audit tracker. Happy to take questions. Dear Chris, that's uh, a really helpful update on where we are with uh, the actions. Um, I can't see any hands up, but if you, I think we've got uh, sufficient time. Um, one of the key actions you outlined there was the establishment of the IM Digital Network, and uh, you referred there. There's been uh, two meetings since that was established, um, and as uh, the chair of that IM Network, David Selway is uh, a member of this committee. Uh, I just wonder whether you'd indulge us, David, to give us a flavour of. Um, 
what that what you feel that group is is achieving. There was a lack of awareness clearly about DHCW's role as a new organisation, and um, a, a, a consensus that establishing this network, certainly the trial period, would be a, a very positive step forward. Um, that's the feedback I've certainly received, but it would be helpful to get your view on the, the positive benefits of uh, this uh, new network. David. Uh, Marianne, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words on the topic. Um, so yes, we, we have established a network. We've had two meetings. Um, principal aim really is a path of us being able to communicate out to the health boards and specifically to the independent members who have a digital uh, hat on those boards and for them to uh, to feedback to us on things that uh, are of concern. Um, that's the principal aim of the, the network. Um, it's, it's to inform and to communicate two ways. Um, the last meeting we had was last week. Um, we had Carwin come along with Jamie and do a really good presentation around cyber security, which was very well received. Um, even in his new role, pitched up and did a uh, highlights of our recently submitted IMTP. Um, there was also a presentation on the Gartner uh, work on the Welsh Government uh, digital strategy. Um, and there was a call for um, uh, health boards to flag up anything they're doing in the artificial intelligence space, which we can have a more substantive topic on at the next session. It's a quarterly network and uh, it's been well represented by all of the health boards, apart from Naira Bevan, which is lacking an IM member for digital at this point in time. But hopefully once that appointment's been made, we'll have a full complement of IMs. Um, and I'm happy to say it's now established and I think is operating effectively. Dear David, thank you. Um, uh, really helpful to hear uh, about the discussions and I'm sure it's uh, a very welcome development amongst uh, uh, IMs who uh, are now going to be far better sighted on uh, the challenges, opportunities and issues that are on our agenda and on the wider um, digital and, 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 and cyber landscape. So thank you for updating us. So we note uh, the content of um, Chris's report for assurance um, and uh, look forward to seeing some of those other actions finally closed off and being morphed, no doubt, into the uh, structured uh, uh, baseline assessment, which will be conducted in due course this year. So uh, we now turn to the estates and compliance report, uh, which is a standard item, as you know, in this committee. Uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Julie Ash, who presents the Estates and Compliance Report. Uh, Julie. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, pleased to bring this, this report to the committee, which I think shows some um, improved performance and is, is positive. So um, within this report, we'll pick up the decarbonisation strategic delivery plan, environmental performance, which includes our certification against 14,001, uh, compliance stats and health and safety stats. So I've widened, widened it out a little bit just to include a little bit more information. And I thought it was probably important to mention some groups we've got in place which support this work. So we have a decarbonisation working group, an environmental awareness group. We have our safety, health and environmental sheet group and a water safety group. So there's quite a lot of work going on um, in this area. So some just key points I wanted to pick out. So under decarbonisation, um, we've recently become members of the Welsh Government um, Community of Experts Climate Change Group. And under that umbrella, there is a project which is looking at approach to healthcare, um, which picks up how digital is used to improve decarbonisation. So it's all very early days, but quite interesting. So um, I will be attending that project board going forward. So I hope to be able to bring feedback back to the committee on that one. Um, 
Okay, we're going to be working with, we've, we've got two types of emissions which we measure. There's our operational um, emissions, which relates to buildings and staff, and there's procurement emissions. So we're going to be working with um, shared services, procurement services to develop a low carbon procurement strategy. Um, it's probably worth mentioning, and I think you'll probably be aware from previous presentations that procurement forms a large part of our emissions. Um, it's 87 percent last measured, so um, this is a key area of work for us to focus on. So I just wanted to show um, improvements um, since our baseline year of 2019-20. Um, in our operational carbon footprint, so we're actually seeing an improvement of um, well, nearly 60%, which is it's good. So we'll continue to keep working in that area. Um, just moving on to environmental management, and Claire mentioned the successful ISO 14001 audit. So I just wanted to make the committee aware that we have actually held that certification since 2014. So um, we're quite um, mature in that area, should I say, and we've got systems and data to support that. One other thing I wanted to mention um, in terms of environmental management was our um, good performance and waste management. We actually recycle, repurpose or reuse 99% uh, of our waste, which is good and well above target. Uh, I just wanted to mention state's compliance um, stats. So this is testing of our plant systems and equipment. So we're currently at 93%, which is above our target of 90%. So again, positive. I've included some health and safety stats. Your committee will be pleased. I hope to see that there's very few, um, few to, to report, and they've all been managed um, in line with targets. So we had um, six, uh, incidents occurring that was across the year and the other thing I wanted to mention is we received Welsh Government uh, alerts so we've received reviewed and acted upon where appropriate uh, 13 Welsh Government alerts and these can re uh, relate to um, items that might be in place in our buildings that sort of thing so there's quite a bit of liaison with our landlords as well in that area um, and finally take a breath um we just wanted to mention that um we're coming up to the time now when we're going to have to pull, pull together our emissions data to report into welsh government so uh, clearly the committee will have an interest in that so i'll make sure that comes through the formal um sort of approval process and comes to the committee for information and that was it from me i'm happy to take any questions thank you Thank you, Julie. That's a really helpful uh, summary of some of the key areas of work and good to see uh, uh, progress in some of those key areas like, uh, well, there are quite a significant reduction in our carbon footprint, which is really very welcome to see. Um, I've got questions, uh, observations from David Selway. David. Uh, Julie, thanks, Chair. Th Julie, thanks for the report. Um, I just... Um, Seeking some clarification, we've got a 1% um, year-on-year reduction in uh, energy consumption. Does that get us to where we need to be in terms of our target or, or, or not? Yes, it does, David. Actually, I think we're okay. going to be ahead of our target if we continue how we are. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and that's uh, pleasing to note. So if there aren't any other questions then um we are as committee being asked to note the estates and compliance report uh, which of course we we do thank you julie uh, for that update thank so you, on now then to the contract extension standard operating procedure and uh, i'll hand over now to julie francis uh, to present uh, this uh, agenda item julie thank you chair OK, so the committee is required to note the content in the report. By way of context, the report has been developed in response to a request from the chair of the Audit and Assurance Committee. Um, a process flowchart, therefore, is a document has been developed, which sets out the process to be followed in relation to contract extensions outside the term of contract, which are either executed via a contract change note. 
or a variation in terms, and this is complies with our standing financial instructions and PCR 2015 Regulation 72. What I've tried to do um, in this report is focus on each of the scenarios under which a contract could be extended outside its terms, the governance requirements and the procurement products which need to be undertaken to ensure compliance. And uh, finally, the flow diagram will now become part of the suite of documentation in the integrated management system and is embedded within my team and will form part of the training programme to deliver to be delivered by my team across the directorates. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think there's a sum, thumbs up and um, uh, very positive response to um, uh, your uh, your presentation there. Are there any further questions or comments? No. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, note then the contract extension standing operating procedure, uh, which brings us then to uh, a completely different topic uh, in a sense. And it's uh, a report on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic inquiry report. Now there was, uh, we, uh, this was brought formally to the board uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, as a matter of process, we're bringing it uh, formally to the audit committee as well. So I'm going to ask uh, Chris Darling to uh, present the update on uh, the COVID-19 inquiry. Thanks, Marion. The update is there for committee members to note. So I'm sure everyone's aware the inquiry is will play a key role in examining the UK's pandemic response and ensuring that we learn uh, lessons for the future so that Wales is part of the UK pandemic response. At the, it appears there won't be a, a Wales only response um, or inquiry. Uh, the, the update report includes the terms of reference setting out uh, the aims of the inquiry um, and DHCW have recently instructed um, NWSSP legal and risk services to represent us uh, and have had a solicitor allocated to us to support us in the preparation for the inquiry. Um, Michelle chairs the, uh, the the group in terms of preparing us and I think the one thing I'll invite Michelle in now the one thing we've discussed is at this stage it's quite hard to know the full scope and extent to which this will impact DHCW and therefore the resource implications it might or might not have on DHCW and I think that's the key thing myself and Michelle have kind of discussed and grappled with because it's clearly huge um, on a UK basis but how big it will be for us and whether the work we've done today is sufficient etc is what we're trying to get a sense of so Michelle I don't know if you want to add anything to that If I can get my mute off. Yes, thank you, Chris. I was just going to say, uh, yes, agreed. We think it's unlikely that we would be called as core participants because of our role and because it's a UK wide uh, inquiry. But we are obviously doing all the preparation you would expect. So the focus to date really has been in in developing our audit trail. So we've used the Welsh Government published timeline um, and we are pulling together all of the documentation uh, that we have available to us into a central point so that we can we can find that easily. I think the next step then uh, now that we've got some uh, legal support on board with us is we're going to share the work we've done to date and ask them perhaps just to QA that um, and identify any areas where they feel that we could be putting a little bit more focus really. So as I say, the majority of that work is done. Um, uh, so we'll do the sense check and then uh, we'll take it from there, I think, uh, in terms of, of how we need to prepare. Yeah, Michelle, um, that's really helpful context. Uh, uh, I can see that Ruth Glazard has a question. Ruth? Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Chris. Thank you, Michelle, for for that update. I think the question for us, Chair, is around how do we as audit board keep an eye on keep an eye on this. I know we've discussed at board about ha having a regular touch point in the in the chair and the chief execs updates unless there are any specific big items. Um, but I think to, to, to Michelle's point about, you know, we keep in an audit trail, are there things that are going to impact on our resource? Um, it, I, I, we just, I guess, need to agree as a committee how we keep an eye on it because it's so important, but it's likely to run for a very long time. So, you know, we, I wouldn't expect a full paper on it at every board, but there must be some update mechanism that we can have that will that will make sure we can uh, 
keep that overview in terms of assurance that we're we're doing everything we should be. Thank you, Ruth. I think that's a really important point, actually, um, for, for this committee specifically. Uh, it is uh, going to be a huge piece of work, a major inquiry, which will take years, no doubt, to complete. Um, Chris, have you given some thought yet how we as a committee, I know we've not formally discussed it yet, but I think it's probably an action that we should take out of this committee. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really helpful suggestion and action for us to take. I was just going to say, in terms of context, I know a lot of um, our health board and NHS trust colleagues have recruited dedicated teams to respond to the inquiry. Now, clearly their situations are different to ours and therefore their needs are different. But I think Ruth's point is right in terms of what we're doing at the moment is on top of people's day jobs. So at some point that could become untenable or unsustainable in terms of um, our resource to respond. We don't feel at the moment we need a dedicated team in the way other health bodies have, um, but I think we just need to keep a really close eye on it as we as things progress and as we know more and understand more about what the implications will be for DHCW. Dear Chris, um, Michelle, would you like to add anything? Yeah, just I was going to say in, in terms of specifics, perhaps then as we we've, we've brought legal counsel on board on board to do this assessment with us, would it be helpful to bring a bit of an update back to the next committee in terms of their feedback from the assessment mm -hmm. um, and any next steps that they've suggested? So happy to uh, work with Chris to to pull something together after we've had the opportunity to do that assessment. Thank you for that offer, uh, Michelle. I think that would be very helpful indeed. I think it is that we're not adding to the overhead, right? This committee doesn't add to the add to the ongoing, uh, you know, the ongoing overhead. Would I would be really, you know, keen that we don't we don't try to do that to you. And uh, that uh, that information might help uh, help the organisation identify any uh, resource requirements down the line as well, which no doubt would be very helpful. So thank you very much for that uh, update on the latest position in terms of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic inquiry. We note for assurance the work taking place uh, to prepare uh, DHCW's uh, input for that uh, UK-wide pandemic inquiry. Uh, our next agenda item, we're drawing towards the end of our committee meeting. Um, the next agenda item is the Standing Orders Annual Review Report, uh, agenda item 4.13. Uh, and again, uh, this is uh, our board secretary, Chris Darling, who will present uh, the Standing Orders Annual Review Report. Uh, Chris. Thanks, Chair. And the, the sequencing of meetings means that I'm bringing this here after it's gone to board. Um, so really, I'm bringing it here for completeness to make sure committee members are all cited on, on the standing orders that have gone and been approved uh, by the board, which incorporate updates to the terms of reference going into uh, financial year 2022-23. Um, so just in terms of the standing orders, um, minimal changes were made. Um, for this financial year, um, the changes are set out within the report. The main changes being the terms of reference, as I mentioned, particularly local partnership forum and the scheme of delegation to officers um, where the changes in the exec team has, have meant the chief executive has um, increased the scheme of delegation to officers going into this financial year. Um, the other point of note was the standing orders compliance. I'm pleased to say during 2021, we didn't have to bring uh, any non-compliance with standing orders to this committee um, that, we, that we've that we been made aware of. Um, in terms of implementation of the standing orders, there are a couple of areas just to note, um, and I'll, I'll be brief um, on this. So um, we haven't had during 2021-22 a full complement of voting board members. Generally, we've had nine out of 12. Um, hopefully, um, that will change very soon in 22-23. Um, having said that, we've been core at every board meeting we've held throughout the financial year. Uh, in terms of associate members, we've got one appointed uh, for trade unions during 22-23. We may appoint um, up to two more associate members with Welsh Minister uh, approval. Uh, there's been no chair's action taken during last financial year. 
and we've adhered to our committee structure as set out in the terms of reference. Probably worth noting at the moment, the Digital Governance and Safety Committee is operating at a core level. Um, hopefully this next meeting will be the last meeting where that's the case as the uh, Touchwood uh, independent member is appointed uh, in early June to fill that vacancy. Um, we've got, uh, we've formalised the local partnership forum as an advisory group to the board during 21-22 and there's a table set out um, in the appendix setting out all the meetings that we held in private, both committee and board and the rationale for doing so. So it, it's just for completeness, Marion, to make sure it's come through this committee. So apologies for the sequencing, but it's just for noting the committee members. Thank you, Chris. That's uh, that's very helpful. As uh, as you say, it's a unique timetabling issue that we've had this uh, this year, and having two uh, change dates. And I'm sure we'll endeavour to to uh, uh, strive that it won't happen uh, again. But these things do inevitably happen from time to time. Uh, Claire, would you like to uh, make a comment? Yeah, I, it it was a really good report, and 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 as such, stimulated me to do an SFI review. So similarly to the SO review, we've done we've done one for finance, where we identified actually two areas uh, where we've made changes during the year. So I, I um, again, it, I could bring it back to the committee for note next week. Uh, next next week in the next meeting, just for completeness. But actually, I'll. I like the layout and actually it stimulated uh, additional controls within within the SFI. So uh, well done. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, that's uh, re really helpful. Uh, so um, the committee is being asked to note for assurance uh, the changes as outlined there to the standing orders. Uh, and I think the committee would welcome Claire um, to see the results of the SFI review um, be really helpful if we had that in our July meeting. So we'll add that to, to an action. Thank you very much. So the last two items, well, the next item is certainly for, for, for noting, and it is the uh, NHS Wales Shared Service Partnership Committee Assurance Report, um, which is uh, included on the, our committee's uh, um, agenda as a standard item. Um, Claire, is there anything you want to add to uh, what's before us here? Uh, no, just to point out, actually, I am the representative on the Shared Services Partnership Board, so I do uh, attend that meeting. And I, I want to thank Michelle because the last one was the one I couldn't attend and Michelle um, stepped in. Uh, the, the point I'd like to raise, actually, is the work they've done to support the Ukraine um, they they uh, supported them with stock items and, and actually I think that warranted a visit from the minister, as it, as it says in the report, but they are quite proactive in that, in that space. Um, they, uh, we talked earlier about the car and lease um, cost pressures and, and um, sorry, the, the procurement report highlighted it. Um, they have made adjustments to the list to try and make it more environmentally uh, aware and to support the decarbonisation problem. Um, but they have um, encountered a few issues in terms of removing petrol, um, some of the limits, so that they've worked collectively to do that. And, and actually, they've, they, uh, they, they include their performance, and, and you can see that there's some commonalities there with recruitment. Um, but equally, if you look at some of their risks, uh, energy, and we touched briefly on, a, on a, a, in terms of energy inflation and the impact it's going to have going forward, um, as they, as our key procurement provider in this space, um, they are keeping us updated with the work that they're doing to minimise the impact and, and use some intelligence in terms of forward cover in that energy market. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, snapshot, but also from our perspective, it's also interesting to see how they report their board performance and the key issues uh, and share that information. Dear Claire, that's uh, really helpful. So uh, we note the NHS uh, Wales Shared Service Partnership Assurance Report, and we're fortunate to have you as a, a member on the on that committee. Unless there are any other contributions on that agenda item, I will take us uh, to our penultimate item, which is uh, the Audit Chairs network committee summary report um, and as chair of this committee I attend uh, that all Wales uh, audit committee chairs which is made up of chairs of health as well as um, uh, 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 more widely 
Uh, so um, it's there for uh, information and for noting. Uh, it is primarily a vehicle for sharing best practice and to share some of the challenges and opportunities for uh, um, sharing some of the uh, good practice that emanates and some of the issues as well that rise from our audits across Wales. It's a formal uh, vehicle which meets quarterly to enable us to do that. So the uh, uh, note you have before you um, arises from our February meeting and the next meeting is scheduled for later this month and um, we'll be bringing a further report again for information uh, to this committee in July. Uh, so uh, we note that for assurance, um, which brings us to the end of the committee. Um, we have a committee highlights chair's report, which um, I will discuss with uh, uh, Chris and the corporate team and uh, take uh, some of the highlights that there are a number of, of, of issues uh, of, of, of good practice and good progress that we've heard in this committee, you know, 12 months on since the establishment of DHCW, I think this committee is beginning to find its feet and to find a rhythm of reporting, which is pleasing and uh, which is what uh, we hoped would happen over the course of the year. So we will agree those items to include in the board highlight report, um, which uh, goes to board and the next board meeting is in fact on the 26th of, of May um, in uh, three weeks time. Uh, I've not been any, made aware of any other urgent business, um, so uh, I intend to bring this meeting to a close slightly before our scheduled uh, timing, but uh, I'm sure we'll all be relieved. It's been a, a long morning, but I think a very productive and constructive meeting. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your contributions your observations, um, the dates of our next meetings. We've got a fairly busy schedule, just to remind you for clarity. Uh, we've got on the 24th of May, the review of the draft accounts, followed by um, uh, the review of our audited accounts on the 14th of June. Uh, and then to follow on the 5th of July, our next formal scheduled meeting of uh, the Audit and Assurance Committee. Felly hebragor ar radio madroddi, diolch i chi am eich cyfraniadau a'ch sylwadau treir gan fel arfer. Thank you again for your time and wish you well uh, and look forward to seeing you on the 24th of May, uh, if not before. Diolch yn fawr.